The Tyranny of Words by Stuart Chase Chapter 1 A Writer in Search of His Words I have written several books and many articles, but only lately have I begun to inquire into the nature of the tools I use. This is a curious oversight when one stops to consider it. Carpenters, masons, and engineers who give no thought to their tools and instruments are not likely to erect very durable structures. Yet I follow a procedure common to most writers, for few of us look to our tools. We sometimes study synonyms, derivations, rhythm, style, but rarely explore the nature of words themselves. We do not inquire if they are adequate instruments for building a durable structure of human communication. Language, whether English, French, or Chinese, is taken for granted, a basic datum. Writers search their memories for a better word to use in a given context, but are no more in the habit of questioning language than of questioning the weather. There it is. We assume that we know exactly what we mean and that readers who do not understand us should polish their wits. Years ago, I read a little book by Alan Upward called The New Word. It was an attempt to get at the meaning of idealism as used in the terms of the Nobel Prize Award, an award for, quote, the most distinguished work of an idealist tendency, unquote. Upward began his quest, which was ultimately to lead him over the living world and back to the dawn of written history by asking a number of his friends to give their personal interpretation of the term idealism. He received the following replies. Fanatical, poetical, what cannot be proved, altruistic, intangible, opposite of materialism, not practical, sentimental, something to do with, exact, true, imaginative powers. This gave me pause. I thought I knew what idealism meant right enough and had used it many times with confidence. Obviously, on the basis of upward study, what I meant was rarely, if at all, communicated to the hearer. Indeed, on examining my own mental processes, I had some difficulty in determining what I did mean by this lofty word. Thereafter, I was unable to escape an uneasy feeling, slight but persistent, like a mouse heard in the wall of a room, that something was wrong. This feeling was strengthened when I stumbled upon a little brochure by H.G. Wells, written, I believe, for the Fabian Society, which dealt with what he termed, quote, a criticism of the instrument, unquote. The forceps of the mind, he said, were clumsy forceps and crushed the truth a little when grasping it. Hum, something in that. Even more unsettling was the profound observation of Lao Tzu. Quote, those who know do not tell. Those who tell do not know. Unquote. To a writer dealing in ideas, this aphorism became presently unendurable. Better to put it away on a dark shelf, duly classified as an ancient Chinese wisecrack. Another matter which distressed me was that I found it almost impossible to read philosophy. The great words went round and round in my head until I became dizzy. Sometimes they made pleasant music but I could rarely affect passage between them in the real world of experience. William James I could usually translate, but the great classics had almost literally no meaning to me, just a haughty parade of, quote, truth and substance, infinite, absolute, oversoul, the universal, the nominal, the eternal, unquote. As these works had been acclaimed for centuries as part of the priceless cultural heritage of mankind, it seemed obvious that something in my intellectual equipment was seriously deficient. 
I strove to understand Plato, Aristotle, Spinoza, Hobbes, Kant, Hegel, Herbert, Spencer, Schopenhauer. The harder I wrestled, the more the solemn procession of verbal ghosts circled through my brain, mocking my ignorance. Why was this? Was I alone at fault? Or was there something in the structure of language itself which checked communication? Meanwhile, I had long been aware of the alarming futility of most of the literature dedicated to economic and social reform. As a young reformer, I had organized meetings, written pamphlets, prepared lectures, concocted programs, spread publicity with enthusiasm. Those already inclined to my point of view attended the meetings, read the pamphlets, listened to the lectures, adopted the programs, but the apathy of the unconverted was as colossal as it was baffling. As the years went by, it became apparent that I was largely wasting my time. The message, and I still believe it was a human and kindly message, had not gotten through. Communication was blocked. What we reformers meant was not what our hearers thought we meant. Too often, it was clear that we were not heard at all. Noises came through, but no meaning. Few of the seeds I sowed bore out the ancient theory that the seed of truth, once planted, would surely sprout. The damn things would not come up. Why? Why did Mr. Wilson's dubious, quote, war for democracy, unquote, go over with a roar? while our carefully reasoned appeals drifted listlessly down empty alleys. Was there a way to make language a better vehicle for communicating ideas? I read Freud, Trotter, Le Bon, MacDougall, Watson, who gave me some light on motives but little on language. One found in daily life a kind of stereotyped distrust of words, reflected in such phrases as Quote, all generalizations are false, including this one, unquote. Quote, campaign oratory. Quote, empty verbalisms. Quote, slogans. Quote, just hot air. Quote, taking the word for the deed, unquote. But the, but the distrust was seldom profound. It was usually employed to score off an opponent in a debate or to discredit statements with which one did not agree. Language itself needed to be taken into the laboratory for a competent investigation. For a long time, I have been puzzled and uneasy about my tools, but only in the past three years have I followed a few hardy pioneers into the laboratory. And as Malisov has said, Quote, it is a dreadful thing, with no easy escape, to struggle, lao kun, wise, with language, unquote. The first pioneer to help me was Count Alfred Korzybski, a Polish mathematician now living in the United States. He had written a book published in 1933 called Science Insanity, and its jacket carried the endorsement of some of the world's most distinguished scientists, such men as C.B. Bridges, C.M. Childs, H.S. Jennings, Raymond Pearl, B. Malinowski, Bertrand Russell, P.W. Bridgman, E.T. Bell, R.S. Lilly. They agreed that Korzybski was working a rich vein and that the output might be of great importance. He was exploring the possibility of formulating a genuine science of communication. The term which is coming into use to cover such studies is semantics, matters having to do with signification or meaning. I shall employ the term frequently in the pages that follow. You had best get used to it, for I think we are going to hear it with increasing frequency in the years before us. Science and sanity was harder reading than all the philosophers combined, but it connected with my world of experience. The words no longer went round and round. 
Korzybski had spent 10 years on the book, rating nearly every branch of science from neurology to the quantum theory in a stubborn attempt to find how words behave and why meaning is so often frustrated. As I read it, slowly, painfully, but with growing eagerness, I looked for the first time into the awful depths of language itself, depths into which the grammarian and the lexicographer have seldom peered, for theirs is a different business. Grammar, syntax, dictionary derivations are to semantics as a history of the coinage is to the operations going on in a large modern bank. I went on, quote, the meaning of meaning, unquote, by C.K. Ogden and I.A. Richards. People said it was hard reading. The title sounded like more philosophy. On the contrary, philosophers were harried from pillar to post. Quote, the ablest logicians are precisely those who are led to evolve the most fantastic systems by the aid of their verbal technique. Unquote. The book encouraged me to believe that the trouble had lain not so much with me as with the philosophers. With the tools of semantic analysis, the authors laid in ruin the towering edifice of classical philosophy from Aristotle to Hegel. Psychology, pre-Freudian, emerged in little better repair. Large sections of sociology, economics, the law, politics, even medicine, were as cities after an earthquake. These three investigators, Korzybski, Ogden, and Richards, agree broadly on the two besetting sins of language. One is identification of words with things. The other is misuse of abstract words. This is a dog. Is it? The thing that is called dog is a nonverbal object. It can be observed by the senses, it can be described, and then, for convenience, the label dog can be attached to it, or the label hund, or shin, or paro, but the label is not the animal. We are aware of this when we stop to think about it. The trouble is that we do not stop to think about it. We are continually confusing the label with the nonverbal object and so giving a spurious validity to the word as something alive and barking in its own right. When this tendency to identify expands from dogs to higher abstractions such as liberty, justice, the eternal, and imputes living, breathing entity to them, almost nobody knows what anybody else means. If we are conscious of abstracting well and good, we can handle these high terms as an expert tamer handles a lion. If we are not conscious of doing so, we are extremely likely to get into difficulties. Identification of word with thing is well illustrated in the child's remark, quote, pigs are rightly named since they are such dirty animals, unquote. Ogden and Richards contribute a technical term, the referent, by which they mean the object or situation in the real world to which the world or label refers. A beam of light comes from a moving animal to my optic nerve. The animal, which I recognize through prior experience with similar animals, is the referent. Presently, I add the label and say, quote, that's a nice dog, unquote. Like the term semantics, I shall use the term referent frequently in the following pages. Indeed, the goal of semantics might be stated as find the referent. When people can agree on the thing to which their re words refer, minds meet. The communication line is cleared. Labels as names for things may be roughly divided into three classes on an ascending scale. One, labels for common objects such as dog, chair, pencil. 
Here, difficulty is at a minimum. 2. Labels for clusters and collections of things, such as mankind, consumers' goods, Germany, the white race, the courts. These are abstractions of a higher order, and confusion in their use is widespread. There is no entity white race in the world outside our heads but only some millions of individuals with skins of an obvious or dubious whiteness. And number three, labels for essences and qualities such as the sublime, freedom, individualism, truth. For such terms, there are no discoverable reference in the outside world, and by mistaking them for substantial entities somewhere at large in the environment, we create a fantastic wonderland. This zone is the special domain of philosophy, politics, and economics. We normally beg the hard question of finding reference and proceed learnedly to define the term by giving another dictionary abstraction, for example, defining liberty by freedom, thus peopling the universe with spurious entities mistaking symbolic machinery for reference. We seldom come down to earth, but allow our language forms or symbolic machinery to fashion a demonology of absolutes and high-order abstractions in which we come to believe as firmly as Calvin believed in the devil. You doubt this? Let me ask you a question. Does communism threaten the world? Unless you are conscious of the dangers lying in the use of abstract terms, you may take this question seriously. You may personify communism as a real thing, advancing physically over the several continents as a kind of beast or angel, depending on your politics. You give a careful, weighted answer, or else an excited, passionate answer to my question. But you have identified the word with the thing, and furthermore, you would be very hard put to, to it to find lower order reference for the term. I have been searching for them for years. The question as it stands is without meaning. I might about as well ask you, does ominence threaten the world? Or does buzzism threaten the world? If we can agree, if sane men generally can agree, on a series of things in the real world that may properly be summarized by the label, quote, communism, unquote, then the question has meaning and we can proceed intelligently to its discussion, otherwise not. Can you and I and Jones and Finkelstein come to an agreement about what is meant by communism? Try it sometimes with Jones and Finkelstein. In chapter 11, you will find the surprising results of trying fascism on nearly 100 people. Yet, until agreement is reached, the question can liberate plenty of emotion but little real me meaning. Jones will follow his meaning and Finkelstein his and be damned to you. I read Bridgman's The Logic of Modern Physics and found a similar criticism of language. With four good men in substantial agreement as to the basic difficulty, I seem to be getting on. Quote, the true, true meaning of a term is to be found by observing what a man does with it, not what he says about it, unquote. Scientists, through observing, measuring, and performing a physical operation, which another scientist can repeat, reach the solid ground of agreement and of meaning, they find the reference. If a question has meaning, it must be possible to find an operation by which an answer may be given to it. It will be noted in many cases that the operation cannot exist and the question has no meaning. See them fall, the great questions of pre-Einstein science. It is impossible as yet to perform any kind of experiment or operation with which to test them, and so, until such operation be discovered, they remain without meaning. May time have a beginning and an end? May space be bounded? Are there parts of nature forever beyond our detection? 
Was there a time when matter did not exist? May space or time be discontinuous? Why does negative electricity attract positive? I breathe a sigh of relief and I trust the reader joins me. One can talk until the cows come home. Such talk has already filled many volumes about these questions, but without operations they are meaningless, and our talk is no more rewarding than a discussion in a lunatic asylum. Many of the questions asked about social and philosophical subjects will be found to be meaningless when examined from the point of view of operations. Bridgman cites no, no samples, but we can find plenty on every hand. Is heredity more important than environment? What is truth? What is economic value? Is the soul more important than the body? Is there a life after death? What is national honor? What is a classless society? Does labor create all surplus value? Is the Aryan race superior to the Jewish race? Is art more important than science? I read Thurman D. W. Arnold's The Symbols of Government and looked at language from another unsettling but illuminating angle. I read E.T. Bell, Lancelot, Hogben, Henshaw Ward, Jeremy Bentham, E.S. Robinson, H.R. Hughes, Malinowski, Ludwig, Wittgenstein, Parts of Pareto, Charles A. Beards, The Discussion of Human Affairs, and F.C.S. Schiller's Superb Destruction of a Formal Logic. I read everything I could get my hands on that dealt with semantics and meaning. At last, I began to know a little about the tools of my craft. Not much, for semantics is still the tenderest of sciences, but something. It proved to be knowledge of the most appalling character. I had hit upon a trail high, steep, and terrible, a trail which profoundly affects and to a degree explains the often tragic failure of men to come to terms with their environment. Most creatures take the world outside as they find it and instinctively become partners with the environment. Man is the one creature who can alter himself and his surroundings. As the geologist John Hodge Hodgton Bradley has wide widely observed, yet he is perhaps the most seriously maladjusted of all living creatures. Some of the fishes I understand are badly adapted today. He is the one creature who is able to accumulate verifiable knowledge about himself and his environment, and yet he is the one who is habitually deluded. No other animal produces verbal monsters in his head and projects them on the world outside his head. Language is apparently a sword which cuts both ways. With its help, man can conquer the unknown. With it, he can grievously wound himself. On the level of simple directions, commands, descriptions, the difficulty is not great. When the words mean, look out, there is your food. Go to the next white house and turn left. Communication is clear. But when we hear words on the level of ideas and generalizations, we cheer loudly. We grow angry. We storm the barricades. And often we do not know what the other man is saying. When a Russian speaks to an English man unacquainted with Slavic, nothing comes through. The Britisher shrugs his shoulders, and both comprehend that communication is nil. When an Englishman speaks to an Englishman about ideas, political, economic, social, the communication is often equally blank. But the hearer thinks he understands, and sometimes proceeds to riotous action. The trail to which my reading and observation led me was unexpected. I was trying to learn how to write and found myself for the first time in my life learning how to read, how to listen, how to interpret language. I was looking for means to communicate ideas about correcting what seemed to me certain economic disorders and I found that greater disorders were constantly arising from defective communication. 
At least, this is the conclusion to which the evidence points. For the individual, as I can testify, a brief grounding in semantics, besides making philosophy unreadable, makes unreadable most political speeches, classical economic theory, after-dinner oratory, diplomatic notes, newspaper editorials, treaties on pedagogics, and education, expert financial comment, dissertations on money and credit, accounts of debates, and great thoughts from great thinkers in general. You would be surprised at the amount of time this saves, but one must know how to apply the tests. A high and mighty disdain for all discussion of abstract ideas is simply another form of mental confusion. It is a curious story, I have to tell you. I shall not tell it very well because it is almost as hard to investigate words with words as to lift oneself by one's bootstraps. The formal logicians will write me off in advance for this and other reasons, but I have a talisman against the sorceries of those who deal in formal logic. In due time, I will reveal it. More serious are the many pits into which I am bound to fall because of the persistence and strength of language habits, which are not so much mine as a common racial heritage. As I write, I shall identify word with thing. I shall confuse levels of abstraction. I shall personify absolutes. I shall deal in varieties of word magic. Edit and revise as I may. Many of these lapses will remain, but you are going to read a book where the author is at least on the watch for failures of meaning, at least alive to the grave difficulties of communication. That is something you do not encounter every day. After all, one has to begin somewhere, and this is my beginning. I am going to tell you as plainly as I can what has been discovered about semantics so far, what heady, heady, exciting stuff it is, what it has done for me personally in laying ghosts and sharpening meaning, and what it might do for men in general if enough of them could become acquainted with this, with this discipline. Three human beings, to my knowledge, have observed and reflected upon the nature of meaning and communication for any considerable period. By considerable period, I mean years and years of intensive effort. They are C.K. Ogden, I.A. Richards, and Alfred Korzybski. Each has given more than a dozen years of his life to the study. It is difficult, but perhaps no more so than investigating cosmic rays, which to date are without, without ascertained use to anybody. Offhand, one would expect libraries full of books analyzing linguistic situations and chairs of semantics in every university. Yet, Richards said in 1936 that no respectable treatise on the theory of linguistic interpretation was in existence. There are few, if any, professional students or teachers of semantics. Even the theory of tennis or of football has been more thoroughly inquired into. So I have no accredited, systematized body of knowledge to set before you, but rather the result of a series of raids into this laboratory and that. There is at least one virtue in this circumstance. No vested interest of learning can call me an upstart and an interloper, as has been my lot when venturing into more traveled fields. I shall frequently be caught in my own trap by using bad language in a plea for better. True, but do not mistake metaphor and simile for bad language. As we shall see, meaning implies a check back, a reference to the hearer's experience in the world outside. If a metaphor widens the base of the reference, which is its intention, communication may be improved. 
In the words of Dr. Johnson, the hearer gets two chances of meaning for one, or 100% on his money. The last phrase is, of course, a metaphor and an example of what I had in mind. This is not an easy book to write. Perhaps it will give you an idea of how to write a better one. The field is wide open and cultivators are badly needed. Chapter 2 I look around the modern world. Before attacking the fundamentals of semantics, let us take a brief survey of some effects of bad language in the contemporary scene. If original sin is an assumption without meaning, if people as one meets them, Mr. Brown and Mrs. Smith, are in overwhelming proportions kindly and peaceful folk, and so I find them, and if the human brain is an instrument of remarkable power and capacity, as the physiologists assure us, there must be some reason, some untoward crossing of wires at the bottom of our inability to order our lives more happily and to adapt ourselves and our actions to our environment. Nobody in his senses wants airplanes dropping bombs and poison gases upon his head. Nobody in his senses wants slums, tobacco roads, and undernourished, ragged schoolchildren in a land of potential economic plenty. But bombs are killing babies in China and Spain today, and more than one-third of the people in America are underfed, badly housed, shoddily clothed. Nobody wants men and women to be unemployed, but in Western civilization, from 20 to 30 million are, or have recently been, without work, and many of those who have recovered their jobs are making munitions of war. In brief, with a dreadful irony, we are acting to produce precisely the kinds of things and situations we do not want. It is as though a hungry farmer with rich soil and good wheat seed in his barn could raise nothing but thistles. The tendency of organisms is strongly toward survival, not against it. Something has perverted human survival behavior. I assume that it is a temporary perversion. I assume that it is bound up to some extent with an unconscious misuse of man's most human attributes, thinking and its tool, language. Failure of mental communication is painfully in evidence nearly everywhere we choose to look. Pick up any magazine or newspaper and you will find many of the articles devoted to sound and fury from politicians, editors, leaders of industry, and diplomats. You will find the text of the advertising sections devoted almost solidly to a skillful attempt to make words mean something different to the reader from what the facts warrant. Most of us are aware of the chronic inability of school children to understand what is taught them. Their examination papers are familiar exhibits in communication failure. Let me put a question to my fellow authors in the fields of economics, politics, and sociology. How many book reviewers show by their reviews that they know what you are talking about? One in ten? That is about my ratio, yet most of them assert that I am relatively lucid if ignorant. How many arguments arrive anywhere? A controversy, says Richards, is normally an exploitation of a set of misunderstandings for warlike purposes. Have you ever listened to a debate in the Senate? A case being argued before the Supreme Court? This is not frail humanity strapped upon an eternal rack. This is a repairable defect in the mechanism. When the physicists began to clear up their language, especially after Einstein, one mighty citadel after another was taken in the quest for knowledge. Is slum clearance a more difficult study than counting electrons? Strictly speaking, this may be a meaningless question, but I think you get my point. 
It is too late to eliminate the factor of sheer verbalism in the already blazing war between fascism and communism. That war may end Europe as a viable continent for decades. To say that it is a battle of words alone is contrary to the facts, for there are important differences between the so-called fascist and communist states. But the words themselves and the dialectic which accompanies them have kindled emotional fires which far transcend the differences in fact. Abstract terms are personified to become burning, fighting realities. Yet, if the knowledge of semantics were general and men were on guard for communication failure, the conflag conflagration could hardly start. There would be honest differences of opinion, there might be a sharp political struggle, but not this windy clash of rival metaphysical notions. If one is attacked and cornered, one fights. The reaction is shared with other animals and is a sound survival mechanism. In modern times, however, this natural action comes after the conflict has been set in motion by propaganda. Bad language is now the mightiest weapon in the arsenal of despots and demagogues. Witness Dr. Goebbels. Indeed, it is doubtful if a people learned in semantics would tolerate any sort of supreme political dictator. Ukases would be met with a flat no comprendo or with roars of laughter. A typical speech by an aspiring Hitler would be translated into its intrinsic meaning, if any. Abstract words and phrases without discoverable reference would register a semantic blank, noises without meaning. For instance, <clears throat> the Aryan fatherland which has nursed the souls of heroes calls upon you for the supreme sacrifice which you, in whom flows hero heroic blood, will not fail and which will echo forever down the corridors of history. This would be translated, the blob blob, which has nursed the blob blobs of blobs, calls upon you for the blob blob, which you in whom flows blob blood will not fail in which will echo blob down the blobs of blob. The blob is not an attempt to be funny. It is a semantic blank. Nothing comes through. The hearer versed in reducing high order abstractions to either nil or a series of roughly similar events in the real world of experience and protected from emotive associations with such words, simply hears nothing comprehensible. The demagogue might as well have used Sanskrit. If, however, a political leader says, every adult in the geographical area called Germany will receive not more than two loaves of bread per week for the next six months, there is little possibility of communication failure. There is not a blob in a carload of such talk. If popular action is taken, it will be on the facts. This statement is susceptible to Dr. Bridgman's operational approach. Endless political and economic difficulties in America have arisen and thriven on bad language. The Supreme Court crisis of 1937 was due chiefly to the creation by judges and lawyers of verbal monsters in the interpretation of the Constitution. They gave objective, rigid values to vague phrases like due process and interstate commerce. Once these monsters get into the zoo, no one knows how to get them out again and they proceed to eat us out of house and home. Judges and lawyers, furthermore, have granted to a legal ex abstraction the rights, privileges, and protection vouchsafed to a living, breathing human being. It is thus that corporations, as well as you or I, are entitled to life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. 
It would surely be a rollicking sight to see the Standard Oil Company of New Jersey in pursuit of happiness at a dance hall. It would be a sight to see United States smelting and refining being brought back to consciousness by a squad of Coast Guard men armed with a respirator to see the Atlas Corporation enjoying its constitutional freedom at a nudist camp. This gross animism has permitted a relatively small number of individuals to throw the economic mechanism seriously out of gear. By economic mechanism, I mean the operation of factories, stores, machines, whereby men, women, and children are fed, sheltered, and clothed. If people were armed with semantic understanding, such fabulous concepts could not arise. Corporations would not be interpreted as tender persons. Corporations fill but one cage in a large menagerie. Let us glance at some of the other queer creatures created by personifying abstractions in America. Here, in the center, is a vast figure called the nation, majestic and wrapped in the flag. When it sternly raises its arm, we are ready to die for it. Close behind rears a sinister shape, the government. Following it is one even more sinister, bureaucracy. Both are festooned with the writhing serpents of red tape. High in the heavens is the Constitution, a kind of chalice like the Holy Grail, suffused with ethereal light. It must never be joggled. Below floats the Supreme Court, a black-robed priesthood tending the eternal fire. The Supreme Court must be addressed with respect, or it will neglect the fire and the Constitution will go out. This is synonymous with the end of the world. Somewhere above the Rocky Mountains are lodged the vast stone tablets of the law. We are governed not by men, but by, by these tablets. Near them, in satin breeches and silver buckles, pose the stern figures of our forefathers, contemplating glumly the nation they brought to birth. The onion-shaped demon cowering behind the Constitution is private property. Higher than court, flag, or the law, close to the sun itself, and almost as bright is progress, the ultimate god of America. Looming along the coast are two horrid monsters with scaly paws outstretched, fascism and communism. Confronting them, shield in hand, and a little cross-eyed from trying to watch both at once is the colossal, colossal figure of democracy. Will he fend them off? We wring our hands in supplication while admonishing the young that governments, especially democratic governments, are incapable of, a, of sensible action. From the Atlantic to Pacific, a huge, corpulent shape entitled Business pursues a slim, elusive confidence with a singular lack of success. The little trembling ghost down in the corner of Massachusetts, enclosed in a barrel, is the taxpayer. Liberty, in diaphanous draperies, leaps from cloud to cloud, lovely and unapproachable. Here, the masses, thick, black, and squirming. This demon must be firmly sat upon. If it gets up, terrible things will happen. The Constitution may be joggled. Anything. In the summer of 1937, Mr. John L. Lewis was held to be stirring up the masses, and the fear and horror of our best people knew no bounds. Capital, her skirts above her knees, is preparing to leave the country at the drop of a hairpin, but never departs. Skulking from city to city goes crime, a red, loathsome beast, upon which the law is forever trying to drop a monolith, but its aim is poor. 
Crime continues rhythmically to rear its ugly head. Here is the dual shape of labor. For some, a vast, dirty, clutching hand. For others, a Galahad in armor. Pacing to and fro with remorseless tread are the truss and the utilities, bloated, unclean monsters with enormous biceps. Here is Wall Street, a crouching dragon ready to spring upon assets not already nailed down in any other section of the country. The consumer, a pathetic figure in a gray shawl, goes warily to market. Capital and labor each give her a kick as she passes, while commercial advertising, a playful sprite, squirts perfume into her eyes. From the rear, sex is a foul creature, but when she turns, she becomes wildly alluring. Here is the home, a bright fireplace in the stratosphere. The economic man strolls up and down, completely without vertebrae. He is followed by a shambling demon called the Law of Supply and Demand. Production, a giant with lightning in his fist, parades reluctantly with distribution, a thin, gaunt girl given to fainting spells. Above the oceans, the golden scales of a favorable balance of trade occasionally glitters in the sun. When people see the glitter, they throw their hats in the air. That column of smoke, ten miles high, looping like a hoop snake, is the business cycle. That clanking goblin, all gears and switchboards, is techno technological unemployment. The rich in full evening regalia sit at a loaded banquet table which they may never leave, gorging themselves forever amid the crystal and silver. Such, gentlemen, is the sort of world which our use of language fashions. The United States has no monopoly on menageries of this nature. Kingsley Martin, editor of The New Statesman, has recently devoted a book to the crown, the greatest book in the demonology of the British Empire. It is a careful study in contemporary fetishism, tracing the growth and pointing out the dangers of that totem and taboo culture which has been substituted in the British Isles for the rites of the Druids and painting the body blue. Mr. Martin questions whether the labors of the shamans and witch doctors in creating the perfect father image have not been a little overdone. It will be hard now to build the new king into a god after the scandalously human behavior of Edward VIII. Handicraft communities could handle language without too seriously endangering their survival. They tortured and sometimes killed poor old ladies as witches. They reduced their own efficiency in acquiring the necessities of life by elaborate rituals and superstitions. But while language was a handicap, it was not a major menace. There was not much reading or writing. Plenty of first-hand experience acted as a check on unprovable statements. Our age communities have grown far beyond the check of individual experience. They rely increasingly on printed matter, radio communication at a distance. This has operated to enlarge the field for words, absolutely and relatively, and has created a paradise of fakirs, a community of semantic illiterates, of persons unable to perceive the meaning of what they read and hear is one of perilous equilibrium. Advertisers as well as demagogues thrive on this illiteracy. The case against the advertising of commercial products has hitherto rested on mendacity. In modern times, outright mendacity such as a cure for cancer, is tempered with spurious identification. 
The advertiser often creates verbal goods, turning the reader's attention away from the actual product. He sells the package, and especially the doctrinal mad matter around the package. The plain woman, by using a given cosmetic, is invited to become Cleopatra, vested with all the allure of the East. In brief, consumers often pay their money for the word rather than for the thing. Without ability to translate words into verifiable meanings, most people are the inevitable victims of both commercial and literary fraud. Their mental life is increasingly corrupted. Unlettered peasants have more sales resistance and frequently more sense. Foreign traders in Mexico complain bitterly of the damned wantlessness of the Indians. The Indians are a handicraft people and take meaning more from doing than from talking. One wonders if modern methods of mass education promote as much knowledge in children's minds as they do confusion. Certainly in Germany, Italy, and Russia today, the attempt is being made to bind the minds of children as once the feet of Chinese gentlewomen were bound. Millions of mental cripples may result. The outside world, remarks Korzybski, is full of devastating energies and an organism may only be called adapted to life when it is not only when it not only receives stimuli, but also has protective means against stimuli. Without knowledge of the correct use of words, most of us are defenseless against harmful stimuli. Those who deliberately teach people to fly from reality through cults, mythologies, and dogmas are helping them to be unsane, to deal with phantoms, to create dream states, Fortunately, there is nothing seriously the matter with our natural mental equipment. It might be improved, but the normal human brain, to quote Korzybski, has the possibility of making at least 10 with 2,783,000 zeros after it, different connections between nerve cells. There is no name in arithmetic for such a number. It is greater than the number of molecules in the universe, greater than the number of seconds which the sun has existed. With such a switchboard, the human brain ought to suffice for ordinary working purposes. People are not dumb because they lack mental equipment. They are dumb because they lack an adequate method for the use of that equipment. Those intellectuals whose pastime is to sit on high fences and deplore the innate stupidity of the herd are on a very shaky fence. Often, if they but knew it, they are more confused than the man on the street, for they deal in loftier abstractions. When I hear a man say, we never can get anywhere because the masses are so stupid, I know that I am in the presence of a mythmaker, caught on his high perch behind the bars of a verbal prison. Chapter 3 Inside and Outside Thinking creatures are forced to make a sharp distinction between the happenings inside their skins and those without. Inside is the me, outside is the world. The me is unique individual, different from every other me. No two ladybugs or even amoebas show identical characteristics. The chief business of the me is to come to terms with the world, reproduce its kind, and live as long and as comfortably as possible. No operations have yet been performed or perhaps will ever be which show me's elsewhere than in living bodies behaving in a living world. C. M. Child says, The organism is inexplicable without environment. Every characteristic of it has some relation to environmental factors, and particularly the organism as a whole, i.e., 
the unity and order, the physiological differences, relations, and harmonies between its parts are entirely meaningless except in relation to an external world. The environment beyond the me may be described on three levels. The macroscopic, or normal, which we see with our eyes and touch with our hands. The microscopic, which we can peer into with instruments. And the submicroscopic, which we do not consciously see or feel, but can deduce with the relations established primarily by mathematis mathematics. Before the first microscope was invented, no human being had knowledge of minute phenomena, and before atoms were indicated, there was no verifiable concept of the mi submicroscopic world. Although guesses, largely inaccurate, were made about atoms as far back as the ancient Greeks, for the overwhelming proportion of his history, man has dealt with his environment only on the macroscopic or normal level. The thing called a stone was recognized as such, and not as a mad dance of atoms. Only lately have we learned that we are immersed in a vast sea of energy manifestations called the plenum, out of which we abstract a few for everyday use. Scientific knowledge at the present time, to quote Korzybski, indicates that ordinary material objects represent, quote, extremely rare and very complex cases of the benottedness of the plenum, that life represents extremely rare and very complex special cases of the material world. And finally, that intelligent life represents increasingly complex and still more rare special cases of life. Unquote. The scientific materialist of the 19th century is as homeless as a classical philosopher in this post Einsteinian world. A rough parallel of these three levels in human terms may be drawn as follows. Macroscopic, persons as seen by each other in daily life. Microscopic, persons and their lights and livers as seen by physicians, clinical technicians, and other scientists. Laymen are beginning to be aware of this level. They know that many diseases, such as typhoid fever, are spread by microscopic organisms and have learned to take precautions against them. Submicroscopic Persons as space-time events beyond the reach of the senses and of the most powerful microscope, there is some evidence that human thought is accompanied by electrochemical activity in the cortex and so may be on this level. Eddington calls our attention to two fables. The first is his ordinary writing table, familiar to him on the normal level for many years. It has extension, it is comparatively permanent, it is colored, above all, it is substantial. On the microscopic level, it is safe to say that the grain of the wood and the metal of the handles would show some startling changes, but substance would remain. The other is his scientific table down in the submicroscopic realm. Quote, it is a more recent acquaintance, and I do not feel so familiar with it. It is part of a world which in more devious ways has forced itself upon my attention. My scientific table is mostly emptiness. Sparsely scattered in that emptiness are numerous electric charges rushing about with great speed, but their combined bulk amounts to less than a billionth of the bulk of the table itself. Notwithstanding its strange construction, it turns out to be an entirely efficient table. It supports my writing paper as satisfactorily as table number one. For when I lay a paper on it, the little electric particles with their headlong speed keep on hitting the underside, 
so that the paper is maintained in shuttlecock fashion at a nearly steady level. If I lean upon this table, I shall not go through it. Or, to be strictly accurate, the chance of my scientific elbow going through my scientific table is so excessively small that it can be neglected in practical life. Unquote. The physicist used to borrow all his basic raw material from the familiar world that eyes see and fingers grasp. He does so no longer. Many of his raw materials today are electrons, quanta, potentials, Hamiltonian functions, and he is careful to guard them from contamination by macroscopic concepts. In breaking down matter into electric charges, he has traveled far from the old solid writing table. The concept of substance has lost its meaning. The trend of modern physics is to relinquish the traditional categories of things. The Greeks, you remember, would divide the universe into earth, air, water, fire, and to substitute a common background for all experience. Whether we are studying a material object, a magnetic field, a geometrical figure, or a duration of time, our scientific information is summed up in measures. Neither the apparatus of measurement nor the mode of using it suggests that there is anything essentially different in these problems. The measures themselves afford no ground for a classification by categories. Thus, Einstein linked space and time and matter together into one organic concept. He found, among other things, that the faster a body moved, the greater was its mass. We must be careful to keep our concepts clear and remember which level we are on. At the normal level of everyday life, substances have plenty of practical meaning. You had better not try to crash your scientific elbow through a scientific table. You had better not refuse to dodge a flat iron because it can be described as electrical charges in an encircling emptiness. To our senses, the chunk of iron is solid stuff. But in submicroscopic regions, the concept of substance gives way to a totally different concept best expressed in the language of mathematics. There is a profound semantic lesson here. The meaning of an event is not something fixed and eternal, but shifts with the context or the operation which is being performed upon it. Iron means one thing to a blacksmith hammering a horseshoe and another thing to a physicist studying atomic structure. When an engineer builds a modern steel bridge, both concepts are useful. Let us recapitulate the known relations between the me and the environment. For this relationship is at the heart of the problem of meaning and language. If we cast an inventory of that which is outside our skins, we note objects, forces, things at three levels. In the submicroscopic world, we have evidence verified by operations of events, plenum, atoms, quantum activity, electrical phenomena. This world has taken no final orderly shape, but many items on its inventory sheet have been verified and more are being added every year. The inventory is good enough to make possible the electric icebox in your kitchen. In the microscopic world, we note chromosomes, cells, bacteria, Someday, perhaps, the larger molecules may be subject to direct observation. In the normal world, we find the immemorial objects of man's attention, stars, sun, moon, clouds, water, earth, mountain and plain, trees and plants, rocks and metals, towns, houses, animals, insects, and human beings. Things like these and their relations and behaviors are all that we find. The inventory contains no beings, no objects, corresponding to justice, democracy, fascism, capitalism, no principles or essence of any kind. Beyond our skins are only things moving, still vital and less vital. 
changing, behaving, the capitalisms, the principles, are created in our heads by language and by language are objectified. The most powerful microscope cannot find them. Animals lacking words take their meanings from the inventory on the macroscopic level and so far as we know do not deal in lofty abstractions. Does a horse know when he crosses the border from France into Germany? Men, like animals, must begin the learning process with the inventory. The concept democracy may have useful meaning in a given context with severely limited characteristics, but it has no fixed and absolute meaning. One can intelligently discuss political groups labeled democracies, conducted in a given setting at a given place at a given time, how citizens, for instance, participated in the Athenian state or in the New England town meeting. But when one affirms categorically democracy is, thus and so, here, there, and everywhere, or free speech is, this and that, here, there, and everywhere, he enters into cloud cuckoo land. If iron can slip from the category of substance, how much more easily can these higher and vaguer abstractions melt and disappear? Through their senses, animals, including man, gradually come to understand for purposes of survival the grosser aspects of their environment. For man, more than 20 senses have been listed, although we continue to cling to the classic five. In addition to sight, smell, taste, touch, hearing, there are said to be, among others, a muscular sense used, for instance, in judging weight by lifting an object, a temperature sense, and a pain sense which differ from touch, an articular sense attendant upon the articulation of the joints of the body, a distance sense, especially developed in the blind, who judge with considerable accuracy how far away a thing is without seeing it, a static sense by which equilibrium is aided. The receptors for the last named are located in the canals of the inner ear. Disturbances of these receptors is what makes one seasick. The senses are clever, but they miss the greater part of what is going on. C. Judson Herrick has prepared a table in his Introduction to Neurology, which indicates the alarming number of things of which our senses are unaware. The skin is sensitive to mechanical vibrations up to 1,552 per second, but beyond that point feels only a steady push. The ear is aware of sound traveling by wavelengths of 13 mm. And what I think he means here is millihertz, up to 12,280 mm or millihertz, but does not hear sounds below or above these limits. Some animals have a wider sound range. The skin is aware of heat waves only from 0 0.0008 mm to 0.1 mm long. The eye takes cognizance of light waves from 0 0.0008 mm to 0 0.0004 mm, but misses electric waves, ultraviolet rays, x-rays, gamma rays, and cosmic rays running from wavelengths from 0 0.0004 mm to 8 to the billionth mm. A biologist tells me on a rough estimate that the eye sees about one twelve thousandth of what there is to see. Photoelectric cells sensitive to infrared rays to which the human eye is blind are now used to protect bank vaults. The safe cracker cannot see the light to which the cell is sensitive. When his body comes between the cell and the light source, the cell proceeds to put into action gongs, sirens, and automatic calls to police headquarters. A flashlight explodes. 
A camera takes his picture, while down from overhead comes a tear gas bomb to render him helpless until the police arrive. A tooth wheel spinning at increasing speeds pre presently gives the finger touching it the feeling no longer of teeth, but of a smooth rim. A bladed fan above a certain speed of revolution impresses the eye as a flat, continuous surface. The senses of man do not know what this thing, this rock, this knife, this electric light may be, but they have received a sign from the outside world and they abstract the event in functions hopefully suitable for the survival of the organism. The rock to be avoided by the canoe, the knife to kill the game, the electric light to show the road. To the thing which this sign indicates, human beings in due course give a name. But the name is not the thing. The thing is nameless and nonverbal. Let us follow Korzybski in his analysis of an apple. At the submicroscopic level, it can be described as a nonverbal, uneatable event in space time. At the normal level, it becomes a nonverbal, eatable object. At the verbal level, level, it is labeled apple and may be described by various characteristics round, red, juicy, containing seeds, and so on. At a higher level of abstraction, we may class it as a fruit, higher still as a food. At this point, we are a long way from the event. The objective apple in December may be an appetizing thing. Not so in the following May when it has become a brown and rotted splash. The apple, then, is obviously a process and not a static object. Similarly, a flat iron is a process, but at any given temperature, the time scale must be much longer to measure a substantial change. Why is the object nonverbal? Korzybski describes an infuriating game he sometimes inflicts upon doubters of this statement. He begins with a short discussion on a serious subject. Then he goes on to ask the victim the meanings of the words employed. This proceeds merrily for about ten minutes with the usual defining of terms, but presently the victim finds himself going in circles, defining space by length and length by space. Any further pressure upon him results in lamentable nervous disturbances. He blushes, sweats, paces up and down, begins to mistrust his reason. This has happened to everyone on whom the wretched game has been tried. The cause is clear. The bottom has been reached. This is as far as the language mechanism goes. Below lie the meanings of undefined terms, which we somehow know but cannot tell. The nonverbal level where one can point but cannot utter. The very threshold where the senses make contact with the outside world. This contact comes before language and cannot be spoken. The eye receives light waves from the apple but says nothing. This apple, any apple, any object or act is on the nonverbal level. Here we see it as a cat sees it, quietly and without words. A group of synonyms does not define an object. A careful description may help bring it into focus for the listener, but is not conclusive. Final identification is achieved only by pointing to the apple, touching it with the hand, seeing it with the eyes, tasting it with the mouth, and so recognizing it as nonverbal. Here is the base from which all our proud words rise every last one of them, and to it they must constantly return and be refreshed. Failing this, they wander into regions where there are no apples, no objects, no acts, and so they become symbols for airy chunks of nothing at all. In these regions, the listener cannot know what the speaker is talking about. However, firmly, he may nod his head. Example. 
Philosophy is a faith that dares to reason. Prudence is a policy that dares to bargain. Pedagogy is an experiment that dares to conclude. Find the apple in this thought for the day. Alan Upward plays another game with the same moral. He reaches for the dictionary to find a definition of the word mind. Mind, thoughts, sentiments, intellectual capacity, etc. Then he turns to the, to the definition of thought. Thought, operations of the mind, ideas, image formed in the mind. Putting the two definitions together, he gets mind equals thought equals images. Formed in the images, formed in the images, formed in the images, a recurring decimal. A man, says Upward, is teaching a boy the use of the bow. He leans over the boy from behind, grasping the boy's hand in his and guiding him while the bow is drawn. No words need be spoken. The boy is understanding how to draw the bow. The senses apprehend the bowstring or the apple and say nothing. How does the saying get in? That is a complicated story on which the neurologists are still at work. Roughly, on the testimony of present knowledge, the circuit is something like this. Messages from the outside world in the form of light waves, sound waves, tactual pressures, strike the nerve ends and start an impulse, probably electrochemical. The impulse speeds through the nerves toward the brain, but it may or may not reach the higher brain centers. It appears to be held for appropriate action in one of three regions, in the spinal cord and cerebellum, in the midbrain and thalamic region, in the cortex or higher brain, the lower nervous centers take care of simple stimulus and response matters such as the eye wink and maintaining balance. The thalamus takes care of vivid, dynamic, and emotional matter calling for a quick response with little reflection, such as hitting back if someone strikes you. Certain messages, however, especially and significantly in human beings, are passed into the cortex for reflection and appropriate action. This is what we call thought. The, the higher animals possess a cortex and can presumably indulge in reflection, and then, after a definite time lag, in action. The lower animals and insects operate more automatically on lower nerve centers. A rat has a cortex, but does not overburden it. If you teach a rat to perform a simple trick and then remove his cortex surgically, the training is wholly lost. However, he can be retrained and will perform the trick almost as well as before. There is record of a boy born without a cortex. He died before he was four years old without showing any signs of intelligence or even of hunger and thirst. The first year passed in profound stupor, the next two in constant crying. It took millions of years of evolution to build the cortex from the simple nervous structure of the lower brain. Thinking requires little physical energy. Thinking hard, as contrasted with the mind at rest, increases measurable energy consumption by only 3 or 4 percent. But the electrical activity of the brain is unremitting. If two metal electrodes are attached to different areas of the head, they can pick up the flow of electricity from an area of high potential to a lower one. This flow can then be plotted. For an average subject at rest with the eyes closed, the chart shows a rhythmic series of waves averaging 10 to the second. Open your eyes. The, the even rhythm stops. Do a hard sum in mathematics. The curve becomes jagged. In sleep, in hypnosis, the waves change their pattern again. The thing that impresses all investigators, says G.W. Gray, is the ceaseless continuity of brain activity. Perhaps thousands or even millions of cells are discharging many times every second. 
Wave patterns vary from person to person, and it has been proposed that brain wave charts would make a better source of identification than fingerprints. You cannot throw acid on your brain. Identical twins, however, have practically the same wave patterns. The chief difference between the brain of a man and the brain of an ape is not in apparatus, but in association paths, which are more numerous and more complex in man. He has a more complicated switchboard. If these paths become seriously blocked, the man rapidly becomes less than human. The human nervous structure is cyclical, like the wiring system of a house, and has a natural direction from sense organ to lower centers to subcortical layers to cortex and return by various paths. First the sensation, the sign from the world without, then reflection. Some unbalanced persons reverse this order. To them, meaning comes first, sensation follows. They see things which are not there, hear things, feel pain, and produce symptoms of paralysis for no physical cause. Semantic blockage of any kind, according to Korzybski, tends to reversal of nerve currents. Altogether, too many of us who consider ourselves normal are, by objectifying abstractions, seeing things which are not there. Are we crazy then? Not hopelessly, but daft enough to be on the point of shattering a civilization. Switchboards may impress you as an extravagant term for brain behavior. Some interesting experiments on the cortex were reported to the American Medical Association in June 1937. A delicate operation was performed first on the brains of monkeys, then on some 20 human subjects with severe and apparently incurable mental ailments. Small cores of white matter in the frontal lobes of the brain were surgically separated from the rest of the white matter. The hypothesis was that some mental disorders may be due to fixed patterns of response in association centers. If the connections or switches were broken, opportunity might be given for a new set of patterns to be formed along different lines. Wild monkeys responded to the operation by changing from apprehensive, anxious, and hostile creatures of the jungle into creatures as gentle as the organ grinder's monkey. More than half the human subjects were improved in varying degrees from such conditions as tension, apprehension, anxiety, depression, insomnia, suicidal ideas, delusions, hallucinations, crying spells, melancholia, panic states, and hysterical paralysis. The number of cases was not enough to justify carving the brains of all asylum patients. Surgery is a drastic method for curing bad semantic habits. But the experiment furnishes dramatic evidence of the physical fact of association patterns or switchboards in the brain. Gorzybski gives a vivid analogy for the course of message from the environment to the me. Here is a good motion picture representing a dramatic incident. As we watch, our emotions are aroused. We live through the drama. The details, however, tend to be blur blurred, and shortly we forget them, or in an attempt to repeat the story later, we falsify them. Now let us run the same film at slow motion, stopping on a given still from time to time. The drama which so stirred us becomes, under analysis, a series of static pictures with measurable differences between them. The moving picture represents the processes going on in the lower nerve centers close to life, rapid, shifting, emotive, hard to remember. The arrested film represents the processes in the higher center, especially the cortex, where the impulses from beyond our skins are halted, analyzed, checked with memory and experience. Over the movie, we tend to feel emotion, over the stills, to think. 
Let us observe three caterpillars, C1, C2, and C3, plain, striped, and fuzzy. C1 is positively heliotropic. He moves automatically toward the light. C2 is negatively heliotropic. He moves towards the dark. C3 is neutral. Light and dark are one to him. Which caterpillar will survive? C1, because as he crawls toward the light, he finds leaves to eat. He survives under conditions of this earth. If trees grew upside down with leaves in the ground and roots in the air, C2 would survive. C3, poor fellow, is out of luck in either world. The human nervous system demands for survival under conditions of this earth. Sensation, reflection, action, in that order. The reflection is a check back to past experience. Even so, lowly an animal as the amoeba is supposed to consult its memory before taking action. Hello, thingamabob again, to quote William James. Without memory of past experience, we would go off half-cocked at a new sensation and soon be as extinct as the brontosaurus. At bottom, the nervous system is a survival mechanism with the outside world as the relentless drudge. Furthermore, we should not think of the nervous system as a thing by itself, but as an integral part of the organism as a whole. The deification of the head as against the lowly body stems from the fixed categories of the ancient Greeks. You cannot run from a bear or a motor car on your head. The amoeba notes a shape swimming and feels, but does not say another pesky thingamabob. I have a somewhat larger store of thingamabobs in my memory. Where have they come from? For almost 50 years, I have been receiving direct physical stimuli through eyes, ears, touch, taste from the outside world with samples from all the continents except Asia and Australia. Many of these stimuli have been through the elaborate electrical mechanism of my cortex and have been filed for future reference. I did not have to be warned about hornets twice. In writing this book, I am thinking or trying to. This means combing the files of experience, making certain physical observations, and articulating the combinations produced. For more than 40 years, I have been reading about the direct experiences of other people, explorers, scientists, research workers. If I can connect in the file room their experiences with some of my own first-hand experiences, my knowledge of the world is enlarged. If I cannot connect them, the words I read just go round and round in my head. When I was a schoolboy, this circular performance was painfully frequent. I have read and listened to other people's interpretations of their experiences and passed them through the censorship of my mind, always on the basis of past experience, for this can be my only reference. And for 30 years and more, I have been respectfully reading and hearing other people's abstract notions about philosophy religion, art, economics, sociology, and politics, for the bulk of which I have had no standard of judgment, because the notions corresponded to no direct experience either in my life or in that of the speaker. We have both been short of thingamabobs. For the first two sets of experience listed above, I accumulated meanings useful for my survival and my comfort. From the last experience, I gained little but confusion and misunderstanding. Thinking is always tied to memory and experience. A thermometer has no memory and responds to a zero temperature now. A man responds to zero temperature by remembering the last time he got his toes frostbitten. Richard says, the mind is a connecting organ. It works only by connecting, and it can connect in an indefinitely large number of ways. 
Words are meeting points at which regions of experience come together, a part of the mind's endless endeavor to order itself. Experience has the character of a recurrence of similar contexts. It is the key to the problem of meaning. When we encounter something brand new, a crisis in meaning develops. There is no memorandum in the files. Every kit kitten has such a crisis when it first opens its eyes, dazzling new thingamabobs on every hand. Einstein, with his theory of relativity, was responsible for one crisis in meaning. Max Planck, with his quantum theory for another. Scientists had never consciously experienced the phenomena and for a time were stunned and baffled. Non-scientists often meet new experience without humility in an arrogant determination not to be caught napping. They jeer at Fulton's steamboat, laugh heartily at a horseless carriage operated by gasoline. Presently, they are going to tell you that semantics is nonsense. Kittens and good scientists tend to let new experience pour in until some kind of workable relationship with past experiences are established. They do not pretend to know all about something that they know nothing about. We should do well to emulate them. Chapter 4 Cats and Babies Hair beside me on the table as I write, occasionally running a tentative paw through the littered sheets of manuscript and notes, is Hobie Baker, a tawny yellow tomcat named for a great hockey player. Hobie will never learn to talk. He can learn to respond to my talk as he responds to other signs, sounds, smells, sights in his environment. He can utter cries indicating pain, pleasure, or excitement. He can announce that he wants to go out of doors and let there be no delay about it, but he cannot master words and language. This, in some respects, is fortunate for Hobie, for he will not suffer from hallucinations provoked by bad language. He will remain a realist all his life, interpreting real things on the macroscopic level with appropriate responses and having no traffic with philosophy or formal logic. It is highly improbable that he will ever suffer from a nervous breakdown. He is certainly able to think after a fashion, interpreting signs in the light of past experience deliberately deciding his course of action, the survival value of which is high. Instead of words, Hobie occasionally uses a crude gesture language. We know that he has a nervous system cor corresponding to that in man, with messages coming into the receptors in skin, ear, and eye, and going over the wires to the cortex where memories are duly filed for reference. There are fewer switchboards in his cortex than in mine, which may be one reason why he cannot learn to talk. Relatively, more of his behavior is under the direction of the lower nervous centers. Apparently, he thinks, connects, reference with memory, proceeds to many actions as a result of contemplation evoking a decision. He deals in abstractions of a low order. After he has encountered enough individual objects showing a rough similarity, his filing system informs him of the equivalent of, Hell, there's another man, or Great Zeus, a mouse. It is no longer necessary to investigate every man and mouse, for he has achieved an abstract idea of men and mice in general. Similarly, with beds, sofas, doors, chairs, and other things he uses frequently, he finds meaning in doors in general and proves it by going to a door in a strange house to be let out. This is probably as far as his abstraction process goes, and probably as far as any animal can go without language. Hobie's idea of causality is not 
profound. If he objects to being combed, he spits and claws at the comb, not at the human being who wields it. The higher in the animal scale one goes, the longer may be the time before reaction to a given situation is completed. The amoeba reacts almost immediately. Hobie sees a field mouse, but he does not spring. He crouches and stalks. A man may deliberately turn his back on the prey and go into the barn for a gun. Meaning comes to Hobie as it comes to me through past experience. If my experience has been only with gentle dogs and I identify gentleness with dogs in general, I am likely to be shocked and pained some day when I mistake a savage barn defender for a dog. There are no dogs in general in the world of experience, but only Rover 1, Rover 2, Rover 3, some gentle, some neutral, and some vicious. Similarly, Hobie may form a concept of snakes in general from acquaintance with harmless black snakes, and someday, God forbid, meet a copperhead in the swamp. Cattle sometimes die of poisonous weeds because they have wrongly identified all young green growing things with good edible grass. Generally speaking, animals tend to learn cumulatively through experience. The old elephant is the wisest of the herd. This selective process does not always operate in the case of human beings. The old are sometimes wise, but more often they are stuffed above the average with superstitions, misconceptions, and irrational dogmas. The window of the Union League Club comes to mind. Philosophers and medicine men are normally past the prime of life. Why is this? One may hazard the guess that erroneous identifications in human beings are pickled and preserved in words, and so not subject to the constant check of the environment, as in the case of cats and elephants. In the end, of course, a day of reckoning arrives. We are not permitted to misinterpret the environment indefinitely. Pavlov's laboratory can cause Rover 1 to identify food with sound, switching the association pattern from smell to sound by ringing a bell whenever food is ready. When he hears the bell, he comes a-running. This creates an artificial identification. By repeated switchings and counter-switchings, a fine case of nervous collapse can be induced in Rover. One must go to considerable trouble in a laboratory to make an animal crazy by building up erroneous identifications. The route to craziness for human beings is practically effortless. Hobie cannot talk, but a parrot can. Is a parrot, then, the higher animal? Obviously not. Parrot talk is imitation of sound and has no connection with thought or meaning. The symbols have no reference, either real or imagined. He just likes to hear himself talk. Little boys learn lines of Latin verse by a similar mindless process, though I never heard of one who liked it. Sailors sometimes acquire a few words of a foreign language just for sound effects and are grieved to learn by brisk physical assault that they have insulted somebody's grandmother in unmentionable ways. Speaking without knowing is called cynicism, but is a practice not confined to parrots. I find Hobie a useful exhibit along this difficult trail of semantics. What meaning connotes to him is often so clear and simple that I have no trouble in following it. I come from a like evolutionary matrix. Meaning, to me, has like roots and a like mechanism of apprehension. I have a six-cylinder brain, and he has a one-lunger, but they operate on like principles. I am having difficulty avoiding the word same. No two things in this world are ever the same or completely identical. When I grow bewildered in the jungles of language, I return to observation of Hobie as a kind of compass line. What do you mean, one asks. Well, what does a cat mean? 
Then I tried to build up from that foundation so fresh and close to the boundary where inside meets outside. Babies. An adult may have characteristics in common with a cat, but the infant has more. He arrives from warm, safe shelter to what William James called a big, blooming, buzzing confusion. He brings with him only two instinctive fears, if Watson is to be credited, fear of falling and fear of some loud sounds. He is quite indifferent to snakes, bears, spiders, lions, during his first few months, millions of signs strike the sensitive receptors in his skin and trace patterns in his nervous system. To them, he reacts unconsciously at first, then gradually, marvelously, with dawning consciousness. Most sounds made by an infant are expressions of some emotional state correlated with a definite situation. A moving object in the outside world, hunger or pain inside. These sounds have significance to those who tend and care for him. Presently, cries and gurgles give way to articulated sim syllables. Goo, ma, ba, mixed and blurred with plain squawks and yells. Then comes the exciting moment, the beginning of human language the point which Hobie Baker can never reach. Syllables come out of the blur of noises. Objects come out of the blur of the world outside. Mother or nurse encourages the imitation of certain sounds. Presently, syllable and object take on a rough correlation. The word and the thing merge. Remember this, for it is at once the beginning of genuine humanity, and the beginning of one of humanity's greatest trials. The word and the thing merge. All wearers of pants become daddy, but after a little, only the father himself. For a considerable period, word and gesture, language develop together. The child asks to be taken up or, more simply, holds up his arms. He points to what he wants, even as Hobie sits up and begs for food. Gesture language is clear and effective. After the child begins to go to school, word language rapidly takes precedence over gesture. Words, unlike pointing, have no meaning in themselves, except for such imitative sounds as buzz, bang, honk, quack, hiss, purr. Most words are as purely symbolic as X, Y, and Z, but they can carry communication far beyond the limits of gesture, and children practice them with as much gusto as Hobie stalks a mouse. Failure to learn to speak is very rare, only in some deaf mutes, and in the last degree of imbecility is speech impossible. The roots of vocal language run deep, there is usually strong emotion with the infant's early syllables, the piercing joy of recognition, the sudden fear expressed by no, no, the excitement of see, the demand to handle and touch. The word mama, uttered in a piteous voice, possesses the miraculous power of materializing that person. Here, to follow Malinowski, we note the seeds of word magic, in which the name gives power over the person or thing it signifies. In the next chapter, we shall examine word magic at some length. The speech of a child is seldom reflective or thought-provoking. The files of the cortex are still relatively bare. Words are active forces which give a measure of control over the environment. Attract this, repulse that. Words mean in so far as they act. With the passing of the years, the child learns to divorce words from direct action, but the close association at his most formative period makes him a potential candidate for word magic throughout his life. There's going to be a explosion! Boom! Explosions all over! In this classic example, the word made an entirely satisfactory explosion. 
Little Willie may someday become Senator William A. Blower to announce with passionate conviction, Are we ready to throw to the winds that age-old and revered principle derived from the great Magna Carta and engraved on our fundamental codes that no one shall be deprived of life, liberty, and property except by due process of law? If we are not, this is the time to arise in our might and fight that our institutions shall not be ruthlessly violated. Our courts have been rendered servile. The entire government has been seized by one man. Here and now we must scotch the threat of dictatorship so that it may never again rear its ugly head. Boom! Explosions all over! Children are prone to uncritical identification. They appreciate resemblances more than differences. They love great big things and little tiny things and are unmindful of the middle ground where most things lie. They see some elements and situations but leave out many of its characteristics. They frequently generalize from one or two instances. A million cats in the backyard last night boils down on cross-examination to, well, there was our old cat and another one. Thus, it appears that most children do not long maintain Hobie Baker's realistic appraisal of the environment. Verbal identifications and confused abstractions begin at a tender age. Children are usually more realistic than adults in the matter of morals, however. Current notions of what constitutes right and wrong must be hammered into them since they, were, they are born amoral. If a child is taught these lessons without also learning to abuse the verb to be, he is fortunate. Dirt is bad. If your hands are dirty, you are a bad boy. It is wrong to kick Papa. Be good. Such admonitions build up a massive chain of illegitimate identifications. Language is no more than crudely acquired before children begin to suffer from it and to misinterpret the world by reason of it. Is the fault to be charged to the child or to the language taught to him? Jerome Frank lists some results of asking children about names of things. The sun is so called because it behaves as if it were the sun. The stars are so called because they are that shape. A table because it is used for writing. Clouds because they are all gray. How firmly the child believes in the reality of the word. It comes first. It is strong in its own right. Someday, Children will be taught to a different pattern, perhaps like this. That bright ball up in the sky warms us and gives us light. It is a long, long way off. It is called the sun. It might have been called nus or dri or anything. In Mexico, they call it soul. Where words come from is always interesting, but not very important. Once somebody made them up out of his head, as you and Emma Jane made up a private language in the orchard the other day. You can take a ride in this metal machine here that I touch with my hand, but you can't take a ride in the word autogyro. You can pretend to take a ride. Oh yes, you can pretend. That's always fun. But if you want to fly with me to Nantucket to play in the sand this afternoon, we can't very well climb on the back of those letters, can we? Chapter 5. Primitive Peoples Let us look at Trobriand Islanders with the invaluable assistance of Malinovsky. How do primitive peoples draw meaning from language? We run front wood ourselves, we paddle in place, we turn, we see companion hours. He runs rear wood behind their sea arm pilolo. This represents a word-for-word -word translation into English of an account of a canoeing trip. It does not sound exciting, yet the native who delivered it was magnificently excited. 
These words, as translated, cannot express the idea that the speaker had. No foreign reader can hope to understand what he said. Why? Because the words are bound up with native activities, torn from the context of that culture and placed nakedly on the pages of a book, they mean almost nothing. Malinovsky learned to understand these words only after living as the natives lived, handling their tools, paddling in their canoes, discovering their rituals and traditions. He had to experience with his own senses their life before he could understand clearly what they spoke. In due time, he determined that the words carried a boast that one canoe had beaten a neighbor's canoe in a race while passing through the sea arm of Pilolu. R.C. Thurnwald, anthropologist of the University of Berlin, confirms the findings of Malinowski. He spent seven years in New Guinea. After learning a native language, he found that meaning was often blocked because native words carry symbolic implications entirely different from our own. Missionaries with a linguistic gift told Thurnwald that after six years of study of one tongue, they were not sure that they had mastered the niceties and subtleties of the native idiom. Even pidgin English carries various meanings. Me lose him bailus may signify either I forgot to take it with me or I missed my shot at the bird. No foreigner can really learn a tribal language from books, for it is a mixture of words and context of situation. For this reason, too, no person living can get more than a fraction of the meaning out of dead languages, for he can never personally live through the experiences of the culture which fashioned them. To the modern student, Greek and Latin classics are isolated documents severed from the context of situation. It would be an interesting study to prepare a parallel column ex exhibit of the day-by-day -day experience of Socrates and, say, Bernard Shaw or Einstein and note the similarities and the differences. But the data on Socrates are probably unobtainable. Here is a group of Trobriand islanders on a fishing expedition in the early morning. The palms glitter and the opalescent sea is quiet. Slowly, cautiously, the canoes run out over the shoal, expert paddlers in the stern, expert lookouts at the bow. There are signs, gestures, directions, technical expressions, occasionally a conventional, muted sound. Group action is markedly assisted by this action language. Pull in, let go, drop the net, shift farther. Language here is acquired through personal participation, meaning, as in the case of the infant, comes more from action than from reflection. A group of boys playing baseball on a city lot show similar characteristics. Batter up! Short field! Fan him! Second, second! Hold it! Slide! Malinowski analyzes four language patterns in primitive societies. Number one. As a mode of behavior in practical matters like fishing, a mode of action rather than an instrument of reflection. Number two, as entertaining narrative, of which the Pilolu story is an example. Here the action is at second hand, but hearers have participated in such canoe races in the past. Their reference are in good working order. The words of a tale are significant because of previous experiences of the listeners. Number three, as free, aimless, social intercourse. Greetings on the trail. Good morning. It's a fine day. No exact meaning is given or intended. How often have you said good morning when it was long after 12 o'clock? Just a breaking of the unpleasant tension which men feel when facing each other in silence. Conceivably, it might be done by gesture language with 
bows, salutes, waves of the hand, thumbs up for nice day, thumbs down for dirty weather. Number four, as ritual word magic in the casting of spells, curses, prayers, here the word is often held more potent than the thing. The mountain will come to Mahomet at his call. The symbol shall overthrow the referent. This is big medicine, but it seems to be a not unnatural development from the infant's early confusion of thing and word and from the use of words as action rather than reflection by nature's by nature peoples. Early in the history of some primitive societies, the soul box theory of meaning appears. The soul box is that receptacle, location unknown, which harbors the spiritual part of a person or thing. Similarly, the word is the magical receptacle which harbors the essences of meaning. The soul box theory can be recognized in the real existence of Plato and in the assorted universals and absolutes of medieval scholars. In chapter 12, we shall present a tray loaded with soul boxes. Nature peoples assign names chiefly to things they use. Walking with a native in a New Guinea forest, Malinowski would find his attention arrested by a strange plant. On being asked its name, the native would shrug his shoulders and say, Oh, that's just bush. A bird with no function in the larder is merely flying animal. Malinowski found a general tendency to isolate and name that which stands in some specific connection, traditional or useful, to man and to bundle the rest into limbo. Similarly, I remember the names of those trees and plants which were useful to me as a boy on a camping, on camping expeditions or useful in making implements for games. The other flora I learn dutifully from time to time and soon forget. Malinowski notes that the native's interest is greater in animals than in plants, in shells than in minerals, in flying insects than in crawling ones. Small details of a landscape are named, big stretches go nameless. Persons come first, animals next, objects last. It follows that animals and objects tend to become personified. Animism is rampant among primitive peoples. Do we not catch a glimpse of this in the masculine and feminine gender of Romance languages? Even in English, we say when referring to a shipwreck, she went down with all hands. For many people, the old bus is only less human than the family dog. For since early experience warrants the substantial existence of anything found within the category of crude substance, the obvious inference is that such abstract entities or ideas live in a real world of their own. Such harmless adjectives as good or bad, expressing the savage's half-animal satisfaction or dissatisfaction, in a situation subsequently intrude into the enclosure reserved for the clumsy, rough-hewn blocks of primitive substance, are sublimated into goodness and badness, and create whole theological worlds and systems of thought and religion. All linguistic processes derive their power only from real processes taking place in man's relation to his surroundings. Language, we sometimes assume, is primarily the expression of thought by means of speech sounds. Granting that the observations of Malinowski are well taken, it appears that the reverse is nearer the facts. Language, as it has developed and less influenced by reflection than thought, is influenced by the accepted structure of language. 
The barbarous, primitive substances, entities, and categories have left a deep mark upon more advanced philosophies and speculations. The word is still believed to cast a spell on the thing and to have power in and of itself. State Senator John McNabo of New York bitterly opposed a bill for the control of syphilis in May 1937 because Quote, the innocence of children might be corrupted by a widespread use of the term. This particular word creates a shudder in every decent woman and decent man. Unquote. Obscene words are very interesting semantically. If one says sexual intercourse, people are not shocked. But if one articulates an old Anglo Saxon word of four letters, which my publisher certainly would not tolerate here, most English-speaking persons become rigid with horror, yet both symbols have precisely the same nonverbal act as referent. Both refer to an identical thing and should carry equal weight as synonyms. It is a strange language structure where X is respectable and normal if you use one symbol for it, but beyond perdition if you use another. The person has a soul, therefore the serpent has a soul, and it is most evil. The sun has a soul, and it is good. Upon such foundations have soaring systems of thought been erected, while our scientists grope toward genuine knowledge with half-blind eyes. The world outside has a natural pattern, order, structure. Language has not been reared to correspond to this structure, but has grown on a more devious pattern. We try to impose upon the natural order the torturous structure of our verbal forms, forcing the world outside to behave as our words behave. Unfortunately, it is not that kind of a world. Word magic is common to all primitive peoples. In a certain West African tribe, before setting up housekeeping, it is highly desirable to obtain a sampa. A sampa is a prayer written in old magic letters which evil spirits are most likely to understand. It can be purchased at any wizard's for a few cowrie shells. He makes it while you wait. Into a calabash, he puts in a bit of clay, a feather, some twigs of straw, or whatever strikes his fancy, and over it chants a spell. Hindu parents who lose a first child by sickness may name the second by some such term as dunghill, on the theory that the gods, who recognize people only by their names, will not bother to waste a curse on such a lowly creature. What is a curse itself but a word winged for carrying physical harm? Fraser gives many examples of word taboos to show the universality of the practice. When a New Zealand chief was called Y, the word for water, a new name for water had to be found. To cast a spell on a man's name was frequently considered as effective as casting it on his person. Names were therefore closely guarded. According to Dr. J.P. Harrington of the Smithsonian Institution, terror of the dead was so intense among American Indians that their names were not spoken aloud, since the dead commonly bore names like Blue Reindeer or Strong Bow. Relatives and friends after the funeral were forced to invent new words for common objects like reindeer and bow, or at least to change the word a little. This brand of magic inevitably resulted in a welter of different names for the same object and helped to create the babble of more than 100 languages spoken by American Indians. How many tribal wars resulted from the babble? Dr. Harrington does not attempt to compute. The more wars, the more dead, the more new names, the more dialects, the more foreigners, the more wars, the more dead. Word magic is not confined to nature peoples. Herodotus did not dare mention the name Osiris, 
The true and great name of Allah is secret, as are the names of the Brahmin gods and the real name of Confucius. Orthodox Jews avoid the name Yahweh. Among Christian peoples, it is against the moral code to use the name of God or that of his son except on cer ceremonial occasions and in such conventions as God bless you. Caesar gave a command in Spain to an obscure general called Scipio for the sake of the lucky omen his name carried. The emperor Severus consoled himself for the immoralities of his empress Julia because she bore the same name as the profligate daughter of Augustus. Julius, it appeared, were a bad law. Blasphemy, ancient and modern, is a sin based primarily on word magic. If you go out in an American street and shout, Bogum Procliati, citizens will not be shocked and no policeman will touch you. Yet you are shouting, God damn, in Russian. Real estate operators frequently embellish their swampy and stony subdivisions with such names as Floral Heights, Cedar Gardens, and Laurel Meadows, hoping that the customer will identify the thing with the word. He often does. A Basuto chief in 1861 delivered himself as follows. Sorcery only exists in the mouths of those who speak it. It is no more in the power of a man to kill his fellows by mere effort of will than it would be to raise them from the dead. That is my opinion. Nevertheless, you sorcerers who hear me speak, use moderation. A stout speech, but taking no chances. Henshaw Ward says, The savage has just as good a brain as we have. If we make allowances for his small amount of information, we have to admit that his power to reason is just as great as ours. He relies on, on reason. As soon as he has made a vivid mental picture of an explanation, the picture seems real. He does not distinguish between what he manufactures in his own skull and what comes to his skull from the outside world. He does not understand verifying his explanations. A savage has little knowledge of natural causes. Tribes exist to whom the part played by the father in the conception of a child is unknown. It is held that a demon enters into the mother's womb. It is not quite fair to call savages superstitious in such cases, for no better explanations are available. Origins and Growth of Language Theories as to the origin of language are interesting, but they are probably beyond the test of operation and so remain unverified hypotheses. Four theories have been advanced, which philologists in flippant moments have characterized as number one, the Bow Wow theory, words as imitating sounds of animals. Number two, the poo-poo theory, language as developed from exclamations. Number three, the ding-dong theory, words originating from harmony between sound and sense, as in buzz and crack. Number four, the yo-he-ho theory, cries in common muscular effort, as in sailors' shanties. Men, like animals, find meaning from the thingamabobs of past experience and know without speaking. A farmer may work all day in the fields, taking meaning from every side and say no more than giddy up and drat it. He feels that awareness to which Korzybski so often refers as meaning that lies below the threshold of language. Man, alone of the animals, can attach a standardized sound symbol to that awareness. When baseball was being developed, participants in the game knew perfectly well the function of the man who threw the ball over the plate, but had no name for him. 
At first, he was probably described as the man who throws, the man who pitches, and finally, to save time all around, the pitcher. English had a new word. It might have been thrower. It might have been yowser. It might have been X. If yowser seems far-fetched, what do you make of the real baseball term bunt for a short hit? <clears throat> Any sound symbol will do, although some are perhaps easier to get used to than others. A game of anagrams quickly instructs one in the almost endless combinations of five or six letters into pronounceable words, most of them as yet unutilized. Start with wield. Go on to widel, welled, weedle, duly, diwel, lewid. Here are a man, a woman, and a baby in an adobe hut in the mountains of Mexico. The woman has awakened, nursed the baby, and pounded corn for the morning's breakfast of tortillas. The man is still asleep on his syrup in the corner. The woman is hungry. She needs water for the tortillas but cannot leave the baby. The spring is a quarter of a mile away. This is a concrete situation, such as Malinowski speaks of. Action is demanded. Let us apply various language tests to it. First, we will suppose that this Indian family has gesture language only. What must the woman do? She must put down the baby, go over to the man, shake him, and beckon him over to the hearth. Then she must point to the ground corn, the empty water jar, the spring, and rub her, rub her stomach to show that she is hungry. She must point to the baby and shake her head, indicating that she cannot now fetch the water herself. This is good meaning and will solve the situation, but it takes time and effort. Now we will bring language into the context. The woman holding the baby looks over from the hearth, corner to the sleeping man and cries, Pedro, water, quick. We may not know how man originated language, but this little story leaves no doubt as to why it was a useful step to take. We may also draw an intermediate picture. The family have words, but no word as yet for water. The woman can still save time, but not so much. She must say, Pedro, Go and get some of the cold, colorless liquid stuff we use for mixing tortillas. This serves to il illustrate the point that any language will tend to grow until there is an adequate symbol for every common act or object until the gaps are filled. Thus, instead of a long de description about studies into human communication and the meaning of language, we fill the gap with a new symbol, semantics. Some authorities hold that speech centers of the brain are a development of gesture centers. When children are learning to write, they sometimes twist their tongues. Some Bushmen have such an incomplete vocabulary that they need gestures constantly to supplement their words and cannot communicate at night. In one language, the word ni stands for I do it or you do it, according to the gesture made. Many moderns find it difficult to use the word spiral without employing their hands. If we listen attentively, we can hear the American language growing year by year. H. L. Mencken has admirably documented the expansion. New words are constantly appearing to fill the gaps of things we know but cannot symbolize without clumsy roundabout descriptions. The process has been going on since the first settlers landed. The new symbols come from three main sources. Number one, importations from foreign languages such as rodeo, de depot, sauerkraut, tornado, vigilante. Number two, slang creations such as jitters, blurb, palooka, southpaw. And number three, technical terms such as static, speedometer, kilowatt, Pulmeter, 
X-ray, stratosphere. Before Americans adopted the word canoe, one would have said that boat with the curved sides, covered with birch bark. You know that darned Indian thing. Before ragtime was invented, one would have had to say syncopated music taken from the Negroes. Before automobile, one had to speak with many gestures about a horseless carriage and draw distinctions between reciprocating steam engines and internal combustion engines operated by gasoline. The idea to be driven home in the statements above is that we often know perfectly well without speaking, and can usually communicate that knowing by gestures. Witness Harpo marks. But that a set of symbols gives us the power greatly to increase the efficiency of communication. Unfortunately, owing to the form chosen, or rather to the form which, like Topsy, just growed, the power sometimes works in reverse. I find it difficult to believe that words have no meaning in themselves, hard as I try. Habits of a lifetime are not lightly thrown aside. The following illustration may help the reader, as it has helped me. Suppose that an Englishman and a Frenchman are wrecked on a desert island. They are an exceptionally obstinate pair, one from Yorkshire and one from Provence. Each flatly refuses to learn the other's language. Meanwhile, if they are not to die of starvation and exposure, there is hard work to be done. Much of it labor in common. Gestures serve for a time, but for certain task words are badly needed. So they decide by gestures to invent a new language which is neither French nor English. Each, of course, knows the alphabet common to both languages. They have salvaged pencils and a pad or two of paper from the wreck. Now observe carefully what Louis and John must do. They go down to the beach and begin. John points to the sea, waving his arm to comprehend the whole expanse. Louis nods. John writes on his pad, W-A-M. Louis nods. Wham is to be the word for sea and mare. John now points to the sand, takes a handful, and runs it through his fingers. Louis nods and writes on his pad, W-A-P. This is all right with John. WAP becomes the word for sand. Then Louis points at the spring. And WAF becomes the symbol for fresh water. And so they go round the island, making up strictly neutral words, short and easy, for all the common objects in which they are mutually interested, because of the work there is to do. Then John invites Louis by gestures to look at him while he does a pantomime walk. Rab is the word for walk. Ral is that for run. Louis sits down and the action is symbolized as rad. So they invent words for all their common acts. Now the task becomes more difficult. They have a word for tree, but how shall they signify a collection of trees or a wood? They work it out, perhaps by adding es, easy as a suffix. With this symbolic outfit all duly noted on their pads and presently committed to memory, their daily labors of fishing, food getting, cooking, shelter building are greatly aided. Yet not a single word means anything in itself. In due time, Louis becomes lonely and wants to talk to John about his soul. But after a hurricane of French, he finds nothing to point to. He has to get along without abstractions as best as he can. But with the new language, essential tasks are done, and whenever Louis and John do not clearly understand one another, they have but to point first to the nameless thing or act, and then to a word on the pad. 
happy pair. They have no word for communism and so cannot get into an argument about it. Chapter 6. Pioneers 1. Challenges to the validity of language are ancient, if not until recently profound. It is reported that the great Aristotle himself was occasionally uneasy at the surprising conclusions to which pure reason, uncontaminated by observation, led him. Zeno made a sardonic thrust at the absurdities of formal logic with his classic story of Achilles and the tortoise. In one's head, employing rigorous verbal logic, the tortoise always won. In the actual world, he always lost. William of Ockham challenged the absolutes of the medieval philosophers. In a tactful way, he razzed the schoolmen holding that absolutes and universals were mental conveniences and that God could not be proved by words. His principle of essentia praetor necessitatum non sunt multiplicanda entities are not to be multiplied beyond what is necessary, was known as Occam's razor because it shaved clean the fuzzy arguments of the scholastics. William of Occam was suspect to the authorities, but happily not boiled in oil. The Bacons, Roger, about 1250, and Francis, about 1600, were both skeptical of logic chopping, and Francis was one of the principal founders of that discipline, which we call the scientific method. Indeed, ever since Galileo refuted Aristotle by timing the drop of cannonballs from the top of the Tower of Pisa, scientists have been edging away from everyday language to invent new languages and new forms of logic which better describe the outside world. Jeremy Bentham, concerned as few men have been with the exact formulation of law and statute, was forced to turn his great mental powers toward the problem of semantics. Ogden, a devoted student of Bentham, unhesitatingly credits the crusty old Yorkshireman with the spark which inspired the meaning of meaning. Einstein, by bringing the observer into his equations and inferences, shook the language of physics to its foundations, both mathematical and verbal, and gave to both Korzybski and Bridgman a firm support. I propose in this chapter and the following one to give an outline of the pioneering work of Korzybski, Ogden, Richards, Bridgman, and others. It will entail a certain amount of duplication of what has gone before. In a young and difficult study like semantics, however, it may not indicate a literary lapse to say things twice. In schooling myself, I have had to say some things a score of times to bring them home. The reader is further warned that the outline is, as presented is not pure Korzybski or pure Ogden, but a composite thesis embroidered with many examples selected by myself. I am trying more to weave a fabric than to exploit personalities. The General Semantics of Korzybski Our remote ancestors, when language was in its infancy, gave words to sensations, feelings, emotions, like small children, they identified those feelings with the outside world and personified outside events. They made sensations and judgments, heat, cold, bad, good, substantives in the language structure. Though not objects, they were treated like objects. The world picture was made anthropomorphic. Sun, moon, Trees were given feelings like men and a soul was assigned to each. In the old mythologies, gods or demons in human shape made everything with their hands. These remarkable concepts became rooted in the structure of language and the structure, if not the myth, remains to plague us to this day. Cassius J. Kaiser 
Writing of Korzybski in Scripta Mathematica has well summarized the legacy of the past. Deeply and subtly embedded in the structures of all existing languages are to be found many vestiges derived in the course of long ages from primitive beliefs and pre-scientific views of life and, and the world. These languages, because their structures are thus infected by metaphysics and myth, by innumerable objectifications of sheer abstractions, by countless identifications or confusions of various levels of abstraction, are ill-adapted not only as instruments of scientific research and scientific communication, but also, and even more unfortunately, as educational instruments for the protection, guidance, disciplining, and development of children in ways most favorable to sanity and life. A Baptist preacher, the Reverend C. E. Newton of Pittsfield, Illinois, confessed recently that he had murdered Mrs. Dennis Kelly and then thrown her body into the Mississippi River. The state's attorney thus described the defendant's character. He had very winning ways with the other sex. As he grew older, he still retained an almost boyish appearance and became even more successful in his lovemaking. Finally, he thought he could do no wrong at all and even began to identify himself with God. To such tragedies do verbal identifications sometimes lead. Primitive language was cast in the subject predicate form with the is of identify fundamental. Our ancestors called an animal cow. They saw another animal of similar shape and said this is another one of the same animal. Both are cow. When they said the same, they forgot the uniqueness of every object. One may observe with the eyes bossy one and bossy two, but never cows in general. Sad experiences have occurred when Bossy Three, a male of the species, was mistaken for a cow. Is such a language reliable? Not if one is damaged by a bull. Here are three pails of water with temperatures as indicated in the diagram. Put your left hand into pail A and your right hand into pail C. Now withdraw the left hand from A and put it into B. Nice, warm water. Withdraw the right hand from C and put it into B. Brr, beastly cold water. There is thus no absolute thing cold or warm. The use of language to produce such substantives is false to the facts. These words cannot truly express things, but only relations. Relative to the left pail, the water in the middle pail is warm. Relative to the right pail, at substantially the same time, it is cold. Relations have useful meaning. Absolute warmness and coldness have none. Some writers on dynamic logic, like Bogoslavsky, call heat and cold polar words. To discuss the feeling of temperature, the pole of heat and the pole of cold are both necessary. Similar polar words are good and bad, fast and slow, healthy and unhealthy, and so on. Take the word bad. It probably arose to express a vague feeling of dislike. Rather than go to the trouble of describing the characteristics one did not like in an animal or a plot of soil, one said, it is bad. All right, a useful shortcut. Then the word was made into substantive badness. At this abstraction level, it became something ominous and menacing in its own right. One had better not be associated with badness. Badness was incorporated into rigid standards of judgment, especially moral judgment. Quote, this, girl, this girl is bad. Unquote. The statement implies that she is wholly bad, a veritable chunk of badness. But she may also be a charming girl, kind to children, kind to her parents, and perhaps overkind to her young man. 
to cast her out of society as bad is the result of a false, one-valued or two-valued appraisal. Adequately, to judge this girl, we must make a many-valued appraisal. We must know her other characteristics, the circumstances of the environment in which she was brought up, the status of the moral code at the place and time of the alleged badness, and something about the economic and social prejudices of the judge who calls her bad. Here is a boy who will not get up in the morning. His parents conclude that he is lazy. Laziness, as a substantive, is akin to badness in the American folkways. The boy receives the harsh treatment which laziness warrants and presently becomes deranged and unmanageable. Fortunately, at this point, a doctor is called in. As a scientist, he discounts verbal judgments and proceeds to a careful examination. He finds the patient's glands seriously out of order. The condition is corrected and the boy gets up in the morning. By identifying their son with laziness, the parents had almost wrecked his life. Think of the catastrophic judgments being passed right and left upon persons who are poor, dirty, ungrateful, undesirables, ignorant foreigners, reds, babbits, rich, capitalists, bosses, niggers, greasers. I bring this point in early to show that Korzybski, in his semantic analysis, often indicates a standard of judgment which we have long associated with toleration toward our fellow creatures and kindness in our treatment of them. He adopts this standard not because he is inspired with love for humanity, but because it is the conclusion which the facts seem to warrant. Holy, bad girls and lazy boys are not to be found anywhere except in our own heads. The world outside has a certain structure. Knowledge of that world, what it means to us, should be in terms of structure rather than in terms of separate chunks and substantives. We have already noted how iron dissolved into a different concept at the submicroscopic level. Structure is a term frequently employed by Korzybski. Think of a skyscraper, or better, go and look at one while it is being erected. A pile of steel girders on a truck does not constitute a skyscraper. To get a durable structure, we must establish definite relations between struts and girders in a definite order. Relations, order, structure. Astronomers do not derive their knowledge of the sun from studying its surface exclusively. They acquire useful knowledge by studying the sun's relation to earth, planets, moons, and the order of those relations as reflected in day, night, seasons, solar year. The relations of light and gravitation are also cardinal for knowledge about the sun. While the relation of living things to the sun is the most important fact in their lives, let it be extinguished, and in a few minutes thereafter, they too are extinguished. Scientists turn increasingly to structure in their search for knowledge and in their explanation of the facts observed. Korzybski takes a structural view of the human nervous system. Although its structure is too complex to understand fully in detail, its orderly functioning depends on the direction of messages around the nerve circuits, as explained in Chapter 3. When this direction is reversed by physical injury, or, as Korzybski believes, by bad language, the organism becomes mentally unbalanced, mentally disordered, Human beings obey laws of structure, as does the outside world, which makes sense, for they are part of it. If we wish to understand the world and ourselves, it follows that we should use a language whose structure corresponds to physical structure. To this cardinal point, Korzybski returns again and again. He cites the helpful illustration of a map. One cannot climb mountains or drive motor cars on a map, 
but it is a mighty useful aid in both activities. To be an aid, the map must be accurate. It must have a structure similar to the territory on which we are to walk or drive. The trails and roads must bear similar relations. The towns must come in similar order to the actual trails, roads, and towns. If the order of three cities going south is Montreal, New York, Miami, and the map shows Montreal, Miami, New York, our journey is likely to be a fiasco. I once followed a mountain trail map to an indicated good camping place, which turned out to be a swamp. It cost me a night of mosquitoes and misery. As we have seen, most languages, English, French, German, what you will, with their equating verb to be, their false identifications, spurious substantives, confused levels of ab abstractions, and one-valued judgments are structurally dissimilar to our nervous system and our environment. The effect is like a bone crosswise in the throat. We get orders and levels tangled up. We misunderstand and misinterpret relations. There is, however, one language which is capable of expressing the structural relations found in the known world and in the nervous system. It is used with equal facility by a Japanese, a Russian, a Chilean, or an American. The name of this useful, well-ordered language is mathematics. I dislike testimonials, but honesty seems to demand them in this subject. And here is a testimonial on mathematics. Convinced by Korzybski that an understanding of mathematics improves communication, I bought a little book, Calculus Made Easy by S.P. Thompson, and set to work. In a few days of hard sweating, I brushed up what higher mathematics I had learned in the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I mastered the general concept of differential calculus and worked through a few problems. Then I returned to Korzybski's account of Einstein. For the first time in my life and in wild excitement, I caught a genuine glimmer of the meaning of relativity. It was not a matter of words. It was an inner meaning. I think it's safe to say that no language but mathematics could have given me this light. We cannot all turn mathematicians. Indeed, mathematics as communication has limitations of its own. But our great need is an everyday language with a form similar to the structure of the nervous system and the environment. If we habitually employ a language dissimilar to the world and to our nervous system, it is manifestly difficult to know and to communicate what is going on about us. The concept of structure and structural relations is applicable wherever we look. One reason why the American Labor Organization, known as the CIO, succeeded in certain situations where the AF of L failed is that its structure corresponded more closely to the structure of the industry it was attempting to organize. The structure of the AF of L was and is out of line with the structure of modern industries devoted to mass production. Specifically, what does Korzybski propose? He proposes, number one, a better general understanding of mathematics as an aid in grasping the relations of things and analyzing situations. Number two, a constant attempt to avoid identification one should handle the little word is as carefully as a stick of dynamite. The word is not the thing. Number three, a constant attempt not to employ high order abstractions except consciously with full knowledge of what level of ex abstraction one is on. When one says, as I have often said, quote, we must plan with nature for the protection of natural resources, unquote, one must be conscious that there is no entity, quote, nature, an old mother with whom one has interviews, but that 
The word is only a useful tag for summing up a great variety of natural processes. The hydro hydrologic cycle, soil formation, wind and storm, plant life, animal life, and so on. Number four, the use of a little model called somewhat ominously a, quote, structural differential, unquote, as an aid in reshaping language ha habits. At first blush, the model looks and sounds foolish. It is interesting to learn, however, that Dr. P.S. Graven of Washington has cured mental patients with its help. It gives no aid, of course, when mental disorders have arisen from physical causes, but it does appear to be helpful in removing semantic blockages. Meanwhile, the use of the structural differential in controlled experiments in schools shows a definite raising of IQ levels of groups of children. The model consists of metal or wooden tags which hang on a frame in the order shown on the accompanying diagram. By pointing to the various levels, by handling the tags with one's fingers, by recognizing the characteristics left out as one travels the abstraction scale, the manipulator learns correct semantic reactions. It sounds queer, but apparently it works. Let us take any object and follow it through the various levels on the diagram. Here, for instance, is the pencil with which I write. At the submicroscopic level of the event, as noted earlier, it is a mad dance of electrons. An event is a process which does not stop, and to the best of our knowledge does not repeat itself, and to which we can ascribe an indefinitely great number of characteristics. Note the phrase indefinitely great. In order, space-time event, object, word or label, description of object, inferences from description, other inferences and abstractions. It is as near to infinity as many modern physicists dare to approach. At the next level, the object is of finite size. Its characteristics are many but not indefinitely great. It can be apprehended by both the senses as the event cannot. Hobie Baker recognizes a pencil after experience. At least he loves to knock it on the floor. But he gives no name to it. Human beings give it a label. The label varies with different languages. In Russian, pencil becomes karandash. The nervous system abstracts the object from the event, dropping out many characteristics in the process. The human being gives the object a name, abstraction, number two. A statement may then be made about it. This pencil is six inches long, or this pencil has a soft point. Those statements or descriptions are abstractions of the third order. We might then say long pencils are better than short ones and go on to the fourth order. At this point, we begin to think about pencils in general, short pencils, long pencils, pencils as a class. From here, abstractions can break out in all directions. Let us set up one series where the abstractions become of a higher order and so increasingly remote from the object clutched between my fingers. Number one, the event. Number two, the object, nonverbal at this level. Number three, the word pencil, called a label by Korzybski, a symbol by Ogden and Richards. Number four, description of this pencil. Number five, pencils as a class. Number six, pencils as a household equipment along with chairs and tables. Number seven, pencils as part of the term shelter or distinguished from clothing. Number eight, Pencils as part of the term standard of living. Number nine, pencils as part of the term economic goods. Number 10, pencils as part of the term production. Number 11, pencils as part of the term capitalism. Number 12, pencils as part of the term Western civilization. 
Number 13. Pencils as part of the term human culture. On, on, on. Observe how remote from the object capitalism lies, a misty abstraction far from the concrete pencils, loaves of bread, wheelbarrows, bank checks, and dynamos, which constitute the lower order reference and in the end give meaning, if any, to the term. Observe the great difficulty of any two persons agreeing on a referent or a series of reference for the label capitalism. Yet, without such agreement, capitalism cannot be intelligently discussed. Failing meaningful discussions, the main result of using the term in argument is to stir emotions. Obviously, such emotions will be random, undirected, and blind, governed by each debater's mental image of the abstraction. When we say that the label is the object, we confuse two abstraction levels. A child using the model fingers the separate metal or wooden tags and notes that the second tag is not the third. This physical handling stamps the distinction between word and thing firmly into his mind. Douglas G. Campbell, M.D., and C.B. Congdon, M.D., psychiatrists at the University of Chicago, reported in 1937 in respect to their use of the Korzybski technique in part as follows. General semantics is useful in handling cases not reached by other meth methods. Under purely verbalistic management, some patients cannot be reached. In such cases, the semantic approach as we have used it has been astonishingly successful. In many cases, the response of the patient has been not only sudden but dramatic, surprising us as therapists. The elimination of a single identification based on faults to facts, knowledge, doctrinal, and origin has often, in our experience, greatly relieved, if not cured, many painful situations of long-standing. Sleeplessness, anxiety states, depressions, and hypochondriacal symptoms yield more quickly, we feel, than by use of the older methods. We are surprised by our results with schizophrenics, where, in a few cases, it has been possible to clear up the disturbing effects of hallucinations and delusions. We are coming to the conclusion that a combination of group and private instruction or therapy will evolve. There is no doubt that we have in general semantics, a procedure of great merit in preventative work utilizable in the elementary schools as well as in the colleges. A research chemist has supplied me with an excellent example of the proclivity to identify name with thing. He was employed by a large manufacturer of starch. A single grade of starch was milled to various degrees of fineness, of which the most expensive bore a brand name, which I will call Queen. Subsequently, he was called in by a candy manufacturer who used great quantities of Queen starch to make glucose. The chemist told the management that a cheaper starch than Queen could be used without changing the quality of the candy or its chemical analysis. The management promptly acted upon his suggestion. Thereupon, the, moral, the morale of the factory went to pieces. Foremen and workers were convinced that the new starch was inferior and bad for the candy. Output fell. Labor costs increased. Batches were spoiled. Misunderstandings developed. My chemist was an unconscious student of semantics. He obtained a number of old queen cartons and poured in the new and cheaper starches. The workers saw the label and were reassured. Output promptly returned to normal. The, lab the label, the word queen, had made the difference. The working force of the factory had confused their orders of abstraction and mistaken the name for the thing. Identification of word with thing suggests various questions over which men have debate, debated with vigor and passion for thousands of years. What is life? What is space? What is time? 
what is hell, what is heaven, what is good? The answer, of course, is zero, nothing, no such animal, inside your own skin, but unreported elsewhere. Living things are reported, but no life. Good deeds are reported, but no good. Irritants Korzybski calls these questions. In a given context, a statement may be true or false, but there is no such entity as truth. Tell the truth does not mean to utter eternal sublimities, but to tell what happened when you ran off the road in your car on Tuesday, the 26th at 10.45 a.m. Not only is the label mistaken for the object, but description, level 4, is confused with inference, level 5. This leads to more communication failure. Stags run fast. Some Indians run fast. Some Indians are stags. The first two lines are descriptions and true enough. The last is a confusion of inference and description very common among primitive peoples. Human beings tend to prefer inferences to impersonal descriptions because they are more dynamic and emotional. We turn the sun and the moon into gods long before we dispassionately record their motions. The reason the scientific method is so disquieting to many laymen is that it holds to descriptions first, to inferences, if any, next. It keeps its orders clear. John asks, how would you define a corporation? Tom answers, a corporation is a legal device for avoiding personal responsibility and plundering the public. Observe the confusion here. Tom makes two statements in one. The legal responsibility is a verifiable description. Plundering the public is an inference. He lumps the two together, and both John and Tom believe erroneously that a definition is being given. Instances of such confusions are very numerous. They take the general form, what is X? X is a hell of a thing, or X is a fine thing. The objective characteristics of X are not disclosed. To be conscious of abstracting is to know what level you are on and what characteristics are left out at the, that level. The event has characteristics indefinitely great, while pencils as a class has very few. About all that one can say about pencils in general is that they symbolize objects which, one, are longer than they are broad, two, will make a mark. If one is unconscious of abstracting, he gives to words a definite, one-valued meaning. Quote, she is a bad girl, with no ifs, ands, or buts, unquote. He interprets another person's speech as always having that meaning. His reactions tend to be hasty and emotional, largely from the thalamus region. He jumps down your throat with, you're wrong. He is full of ultimate truths and eternal principles, with abstractions fixed as entities rather than consciously recognized as verbal tags. We begin to worry about, quote, worry, and develop a fear of, quote, fear. A hospital for nervous diseases looms not far ahead. Belief in, quote, belief, meanwhile leads to fanaticism and dogmatism. Young men and women make an entity out of the abstraction, quote, marriage, conceiving it to be an actual state blissful beyond imagining. When they marry, the resulting shock is needlessly great. Quote, heaven is less devastating because it its devotees can file no later reports except in spook parlors. Boys in 1917, who expected war to be a horrible business, suffered less from shell shock, according to Korzybski, than those who suffused with glory, patriotism, and, quote, a battle for democracy. Observe that in the semantic approach to abstractions, there is no plea to, quote, think things through. The stock retort of one dogmatist to another, thinking things through, 
has heretofore largely meant more useful mental labor, from thought to word and back to thought again. Here, on the contrary, we are trying to find the object, the referent, to which the thought and word refer, and after that to discover its attributes and relationships. This means a new discipline in many fields, a tearing down of the scaffold of what has passed for thought and building afresh. The structure of language inherited from our primitive ancestors is such that it provides separate terms for factors which are inseparable in fact. Matter, space, time constitute one such group. Body, mind constitute another. We thus try to split in our heads what is unsplittable in the real world. A college boy I know reports that he and a group of friends sat up all one night in 1937 furiously arguing the question, quote, if there were no matter in space, would time go on, unquote? Obviously, there cannot be something somewhere at no time or something nowhere at some time or nothing somewhere at some time. Everything which happens must be structurally represented as something somewhere at some time. We want two friends together. We invite them to our home for dinner at seven o'clock. The friends are the something. The house is the somewhere. The seven o'clock is the sometime. So far as we now know, this is the nature of every situation in the environment in which we live. Yet, it was not until Einstein and Minkowski that this concept was rescued from verbiage and nailed to the masthead of modern physics. Adam says, quote, I don't like Harvard University. I wouldn't send my boy there, unquote. This statement is meaningless as it stands. What is it that you do not like, Mr. Adam? The college buildings, the yard, the location in Cambridge, the way in which President Emeritus Lowell handled the Sacco Vanzetti case in 1927, the theological instruction in 1736, some members of the faculty in 1938, parts of the current curriculum, the appointment of James M. Landis as dean of the law school, the football team, the society crowd, what things, in what place, when? If Adam made a list of those characteristics of Harvard in 1938 which he did like and another of those which he did not like and found the second more impressive, he might properly say that so far as he knew the circumstances, there were more characteristics of which he disapproved than there were that which he approved. Or he might say that a single negative factor outweighed in his mind a large number of positive factors. He could shorten this to, I don't like Harvard, provided he were fully conscious of the abstraction or shortcut taken. If not conscious of it, and most of us are not in such statements, he is guilty of disliking a phantom. He might say with equal meaning, I don't like centaurs. Harvard is an abstraction of a relatively low order. Applying the what, where, when test to loftier abstractions produces even more shattering results. Take beauty. What kind of beautiful thing? At what time? In what place? Take free speech. What variety? In what age? In what country? I know of no more effective method for dragging abstractions out of the stratosphere into the marketplace. Korzybski employs two allied symbolic devices, which I find very helpful. When making a statement about things known, especially scientific things, he appends the date, the behavior of the human nervous system as known and described by physiologists in 1933. Unquote. Scientific concepts grow and change as additional facts are gathered. We can never know it all. Rather, we progressively narrow the margin of the unknown. It is useful to acquire the habit of dating statements. 
scientific or otherwise. Again, when referring to unique individuals, whether they be men, dogs, caterpillars, or pencils, Korzybski uses little mathematical symbols, Smith 1, Smith 2, Fido 1, Fido 2, to set them off one from another. I have already used this device in earlier pages and will use it frequently again. It helps one to remember that there is no mankind in general loose in the universe, but only Adam 1, Adam 2, etc. Besides the indexes and the dates, Korzybski advocates a more general use of quotation marks. The, quote, truth, unquote in order to remind us that an abstraction is being used and so to put us on guard. He recommends a more general use of hyphens and a generous sprinkling of etc., etc., to emphasize the point that characteristics have been left out. Quote, the apple is round, sweet, etc., unquote, indicates that the apple has other characteristics in addition to roundness and sweetness. These devices I do not find so useful as the indexes and the dates, but they do help to make us conscious of language. Korzybski is severe in his treatment of most philosophy and formal log logic. The abstractions and the one or two valued judgments of those studies have, in his opinion, deflected straight thinking for centuries. He gives three symbols to his system of general semantics. A-E-N, by which he means non-Aristotelian, non-Euclidean, and non-Newtonian. These symbols do not aid me much, but they serve to show his point of view. Observe that he is not against Aristotle or Euclid or Newton. Great men they were in their day. He is against using their language, logic, and concepts today when better mediums of communication are available. Better in the sense that they more truly reflect the world outside. I have read Science and Sanity completely through three times and portions of it up to a dozen times. Large sections still are blank in my mind. A book on the clarification of meaning should not be so difficult to understand. Part of the trouble is due to the fact that Korzybski was addressing himself more to scientists and mathematicians than to laymen. Part to the fact that he entangled this study with an earlier concept called time binding. It would have been better, I think, if he had forgotten time binding and started afresh. Whether he will be re regarded by posterity as a genius or as a man overstrained by an idea too big to handle, I do not know. But I am confident that the material with which he has so exhaustively dealt is of the first importance and that many of his findings will survive to do him lasting honor. To one who reads and reflects patiently upon his book, the world can never look as it did before. It moves nearer. Many things which were once blurred and misty come into focus. Chapter 7. Pioneers 2. Ogden and Richards. Korzybski approaches semantics as a mathematician. Ogden and Richards approach it as scholars interested in literature and aesthetics. One long section of The Meaning of Meaning is devoted to an analysis of 16 concepts of beauty. It is not without significance that, starting from such different backgrounds, the two studies travel to so many similar conclusions. They agree unequivocally that confusion of word with thing is rampant in the present use of language, and the chief cause of communication, failure. 
They agree that abstract words are grossly mishandled and that this mishandling tends to populate the environment with fabulous entities. The heart of the Ogden and Richards analysis can be diagrammed by a triangle as given on page 97. The triangle is not a pattern of nerve channels, but a diagram showing relations and so a structural pre presentation from the outside world and sometimes from a pain or other stimulus inside, we receive a sign. Quote, a sign may be any stimulus from without or process within, unquote. This sign we proceed to interpret to find meaning in. Interpretation, as noted earlier, depends on past experience. The sound of a match scraped upon a box leads us to expect a flame. If we had never known matches, the sign would be without meaning, though a savage might possibly misinterpret it as a devil scratching his ear. The sight of an opened oyster will cause a pleasurable interpretation if we have learned to enjoy oysters and apathy or disgust if oysters have never been encountered. Human experience is a series of sign situations followed by reflection and the filing of references in the brain. The sign calls up the object, the match, the oyster, the pencil, which is labeled the referent. The referent is the thingamabob to which the sign refers. We often say shin means dog when we should say that the words shen and dog both refer to the same animal. In the cortex, the files of memory are consulted and interpretation takes place. This process Ogden and Richards label reference, it, reference or thought. The referent is that to which reference is made. So far, this process applies to all higher animals. Man alone takes the next step. He verbalizes the reference with a word, phrase, or symbol. From sign to referent to reference to symbol, that is the order. Animals can limp around the triangle by using a few meaningful cries and gestures in place of words. The words of a parrot skip the top of the triangle altogether. Observe that the triangle has no base. This is a matter of the first importance. There is no direct relation between referent and symbol, between thing and word, and there cannot be except where the symbol is gesture, such as pointing to the oyster. Even then, the, the reference or thinking mechanism is used. Yet, human beings are constantly leaping from word to thing, identifying word with thing. The most prolific fallacy of human intercourse is that the base of the triangle is filled in. Try as you may, you cannot eat the word oyster, cannot sit on the word chair, cannot live on the word money. The confusion of the symbol money with things in the real world required for survival and comfort is perhaps the central economic difficulty of modern times. The triangle gives us the key to the allied semantic problem, the misuse of abstractions. Clear communication demands referent, reference, and symbol, all three. Suppose we disregard referent and simply think about words, using words to externalize that thinking. We cut three factors to two. We then produce great activity on the left side of the triangle, from the reference to symbol and back to reference again. The great words roll round and round. The sublime merges into the good and both into the eternal. Liberty merges into individualism and both into true democracy. National socialism merges into racial purity and both into totalitarianism. 
Many leaders who mold popular ideas and principles perform with a singular exclusiveness on the left side of the triangle. In the next political discussion that you hear, watch for this left-handed performance and take what amusement you can. More often, it frightens me. What on earth, literally on earth, are these people talking about? They start far up the abstraction ladder with magnificent regard to the referent. Yet, unless both speaker and hearer are aware of a similar referent, minds cannot meet, agreement cannot be reached, communication is checked as effectively as when one snaps off a radio. Here, for example, is the Archbishop of York saying in connection with the abdication of Edward VIII, in the year 1937. The king is the incarnation of his people. The statement is gravely discussed, but what does it mean? Here is Mr. Aldrich of the National City Bank admonishing the young at Colgate College while receiving an honorary degree. Quote, we need a spiritual regeneration, yes, in business as well as other things. It is essential that we achieve a degree of national unity by developing a concrete philosophy for our young men. Those who understand the spiritual background of our country and understand what our forefathers were trying to do are likely to be selected for important positions and become successful, unquote. Here is Nicholas Berdiev, a Russian philosopher. Quote, History is the result of a deep interaction between eternity and time. It is the incessant eruption of eternity into time. Unquote. If mental energy were inexhaustible, it might not matter that you and I and college seniors expended good effort trying to understand this sort of thing. But the human mind is capable of a limited amount of concentration, and I doubt if anyone can think hard about abstract subjects for more than two hours a day. Five minutes' serious thought about the eruption of eternity into time puts me under the table. To make a statement is to symbolize a reference, to give a label to a thought, but a reference without a referent hangs in midair. No cat would be guilty of such nonsense. The advance in knowledge is the increase in our power of referring to reference as they actually hang together. The structural idea again. Is a coin circular or elliptical? An observer at table level sees it as elliptical. An observer above the coin sees it as circular. What a problem for philosophers. The coin could keep a school of heavy thinkers busy for decades on the left side of the triangle, discussing the quality of the elliptical and the essence of the circular. By no manner of make-believe can we discuss the what of reference. What is a table? We can only discover the how. How does a table look? What are its characteristics? How do our senses experience it? The point of every discussion is to find the referent. When it is found, emotional factors dissolve in mutual understanding. The participants are then starting from a similar foundation, talking about similar things. The disagreement, if it must arise, is grounded on a firm base. It is easier, of course, to find the referent for oxygen than to find reference one or more for liberty or feudalism. If reference for a high-order abstraction are impossible to find, further discussion is futile. If reference are difficult to locate, that is a bother, but they must be found. We cannot escape from concrete reference by using abstract language. If we try to dodge the difficulty, our words become meaningless. We frequently use the abstraction mankind. 
What is the referent? Depending somewhat on the context or the way we use mankind, the referent is every person who ever lived or every living person or a sample study of enough persons to warrant limited conclusions about all persons. On the basis of persons living today, the referents are Adam 1, Adam 2, Adam 3, up to about Adam 2 billion. What can you say about such a vast collection of atoms? You can say that practically every one of them has two legs and ten fingers and a complicated cortex. You can say they all must eat and maintain their bodies within certain limiting temperatures. You can probably say that every atom abuses language, provided he talks at all. Characteristics, descriptive statements, inferences, which are a matter of common record about all atoms, can be mentioned without doing violence to the term mankind. But you cannot say with real meaning, mankind is instinctively cooperative. Mankind is by nature warlike. Mankind is subject to the law of tooth and claw. Mankind is a spark of the divine. You cannot make such statements because many atoms, as physically observed, flatly contradict the dictum, or because no competent observations are on record. Yet, how often in using the term have you completely overlooked the parade of atoms? A file of men, women, and children, two billion strong, which, if marching one foot apart, would stretch 15 times around the equator. This is your referent. Too often I have forgotten it and used mankind as a lever to promote a private concept of what I wanted men to do or be. There is no entity, mankind. Call as briskly as you may sit, as you may. Hey, mankind, come here, and not an atom will answer. For such terms as the omnipotent, and the eternal. Let us note again, there are no reference of any sort. Meaningful communication is impossible. However, much the user of the term may draw peace or comfort from it. Practically all that one can say about the sublime is that it is that essence which partakes of sublimity. Blab partakes of blab. Two, which is not especially rewarding, or one can say the sublime means the omnipotent. Another blob. Sublime is a useful adjective to establish rough relations, a sublime view, a sublime wine, to be used sparingly for what one considers top-notch. The word derives from the Latin connoting originally up up to the lintel. Terms like capitalism are not so bodiless. They lie between mankind, with its observable parade of atoms, and the sublime, with nothing observable. Reference for capitalism are hard, but perhaps not impossible to locate. We shall try to find some in a later chapter. It is quite safe to say that few people today have similar reference for capitalism, and therefore most of the discussion about it is meaningless. Experiences of individuals differ, hence their images for high-order abstractions differ. It is accordingly wise in a discussion, say Ogden or Richards, to start with things to which one can point. Simple reference with some simple symbols like Adam, one, the car there, that bank, this baseball game. Then ascend the abstraction ladder gingerly, pausing for frequent checks. It will save time and friction in the end. The meaning of meaning sets forth certain canons for good language. Among them are the following. Number one, one symbol stands for one and only one referent. The word rover 
in any discussion stands for one particular dog. The referent may be complex, however, like all Mongolian imbeciles, all income taxpayers in Connecticut. Mathematical symbols have no specific referent, but can be manipulated through laws agreed upon to apply to any given set. We shall enlarge upon this important idea at a later point. Number two, symbols which can be substituted one for another symbolize the same reference or thought. I am thinking about the same object, whether I say Hobie Baker or my yellow cat. Number three, the referent of a contracted symbol is the referent of that symbol expanded, as in the case of mankind, which we have already discussed. A contracted symbol is a shortcut tag or an abstraction of a higher order. Number four, a symbol refers to what it is actually used to refer to. It refers to what is in the speaker's head, not to what good usage demands, or to what the hearer thinks it refers to. If I say, my yellow dog, by a slip of the tongue, when I mean my cat, Hobie Baker, is the referent. Even if you quite naturally think I am talking about a dog, needless to say, slips of the tongue may effectively block communication. If an English shop girl says, the postman is bringing the book, it is probably a magazine to which she refers, not a book as commonly known in other circles. Only such a set of canons, observe our authors, will enable the philosopher to discuss more important matters than his own or his colleagues' peculiarities of expression. When we define a word, we reach for the dictionary and substitute another symbol for the same referent. A sofa is also called a lounge. When we define a thing, we describe its characteristics. This sofa to which I refer is five feet long, three feet broad, made of oak, covered with soft pillows, colored green. The sofa, as an object apprehended by the senses, is below the verbal level, and the process of description is very different from defining a word by giving a synonym for it. The Meaning of Meaning was first published in England in 1923. There have been several revised editions, the latest in 1936. C.K. Ogden has devoted many years in the interim to the formulation of basic English, an international language now displacing such synthetic languages as Esperanto. 850 English words and five simple rules do the work of 20,000 words. By combining 10 fundamental operations of physics with 20 directions of geometry, Ogden got rid of 4,000 English verbs. A bright student can learn basic in a few weeks and for that quarter of mankind, half a billion atoms, which already speaks English, only a little polishing is necessary. If basic becomes general, not only will communication be aided, but one of the reasons for wars will be lessened. It is harder to hate foreigners who speak one's language. Meanwhile, I.A. Richards has been extending the concepts first announced in The Meaning of Meaning in a series of books of his own. One interesting study deals with 12 anonymous poems sent to hundreds of students taking courses in literature in English and American colleges, inviting their detailed interpretations. One could not ask for a more somber example of communication failure. These students, presumably at the forefront of our cultural heritage, differed fantastically in their ideas of what the poems meant as a whole or phrase by phrase, and in their evaluations of them. 
The same poem was extravagantly praised and bitterly condemned. What confused the young people above all was that authors' names were omitted. How could they be expected to judge verse unless they knew who wrote it? Which puts us in mind of Shaw's outraged critics in Fanny's first play. In The Philosophy of Rhetoric, an unfortunate title in my opinion, Richards amplifies with great clarity certain aspects of semantics. The studies of rhetoric and grammar assume that words have definite, one-valued meanings. But most words, as they pass from context to context, change their meanings, and in many different ways. It is their duty and their service to us to do so. We recall Malinovsky's phrase, context of situation, and his inability to understand the words of a primitive people until he had shared their life. A major cause of communication failure is the one proper meaning superstition to wit, that a word has meaning of its own independent of its use and controlling its use. As a matter of fact, a word has similar meaning only in a similar context. Here are four statements employing the word fat. Number one, she is a fat girl. Number two, you have a fat chance of winning that race. Number three, the fat is in the fire. Number four, below the skin of all mammals is a layer of fat. Comment is unnecessary as to the elastic nature of fat or of many words. What a word means is the missing parts of the context from which it draws its delegated efficacy. Take the statement, the blank swooped out of the sky and taxied to the hangar. Here the context is incomplete but it indicates the word airplane so clearly that we hardly need to use the word, the label. The image comes without the word. The one proper meaning, superstition, is made worse by written words because on the page they appear with white spaces between them, setting them off as separate and unique. Spoken words run more together, and a statement or a sentence is evaluated as a whole and the context more readily grasped. The avalanche of printed words grows heavier year by year, and the offsetting blast of words from radio loudspeakers has its own disadvantages. The view that meanings belong to words in their own right is a branch of sorcery a relic of the magical theory of names. We point to the dictionary as the conclusive arbiter of meaning. More magic. The dictionary is almost the last place in which we to find it. Look to the context, the order, and the relation in which the word is being actively employed. No word in isolation can be judged correct or incorrect, beautiful or ugly, or anything else that matters any more than a single musical note can be judged except in relation to a melody, a composition, or at least a chord. Without context, the word may be written blob. By long association, we come to like the sound of certain words, but try them on a Chinese gentleman. Through caverns, measureless to man, is a fine ringing line of poetry. Now, take the same five words and jumble the order. Measureless man caverns to through. Ugly and irritating. Publishers and theatrical producers are frequently guilty of performing word magic by tearing a phrase from a review reviewer's context and using it in a blurb. The reviewer, for example, says, This book is a beautiful example of how to confuse the reader. Next morning, the Star Tribune appears with an advertisement on the book page with a streamhead, beautiful example, QK Hocus. Yet in this case, I doubt if the publisher would legally be held guilty of fraudulent practice. He has misrepresented, in fact, but so confident are judges and the rest of us that words have meaning in themselves that simply proving Mr. Hocus did say, beautiful example, which he did, would probably constitute an adequate defense. Abstract terms are especially subject to change in meaning as context changes. 
At a later point, we shall note how the meaning of commerce has altered since 1787, when the famous Commerce Clause was written into the Constitution. Yet, we seek for a fabulous consistency, and we regard a shift in meaning as a flaw, a regrettable accident, rather than as a vir virtue. The remedy is not to resist such changes, but to follow them gladly, proud of the flexibility of speech. Widely adopted, says Richards, this remedy would be like the introduction of Arabic numerals where Roman had prevailed. It might inaugurate a new era of human understanding and cooperation. The one proper meaning superstition stands glumly in the road. Words are not one-valued. They are often multi-valued and can take as many values as there are contexts. Arnold and Robinson Thurman W. Arnold, in his book, The Symbols of Government, makes an important and entertaining application of semantic theory. His symbols apply not to specific words, but to the principles, ideals, dogmas, mostly verbal, which men carry around in their head. In order to avoid confusion with the more rigorous symbols of Ogden and Richards, I shall use principles in discussing Arnold. A job lot of Mer American principles today includes Democracy is the best form of government. Governments are by nature corrupt and inefficient. A worthy man can always get a job. Pecuniary thrift is a sterling virtue. Laziness is a vice. The Constitution is a divinely inspired document. Private property is a sacred right. You can't change human nature. Principles provide standard rules for judgment and for conduct. Instead of investigating the facts of a situation, one claps a principle upon it. If the principle happens to fit the facts, it may be a useful time saver. If it is based on facts of a bygone age, its application to new facts and new conditions may be ridiculous or disastrous. Principles often make sense at the time of their origination. Although the Aryan myths which the Nazis are now formulating into principles make no sense at all. The trouble is that after adoption, people begin to regard them as eternal, good for any situation, anywhere, at any time. Taking the job lot listed above, we note that the dogma about the inefficiency of governments probably originated with the English economists around 1820 and ceased to have much relation to the facts after the very efficient British civil service was inaugurated in the 1870s. The principles about the worthy man and his job, the beauties of thrift, and the vices of laziness squared with the facts so long as America was a nation of pioneers. The principles began to be inapplicable in the eastern section of the country after 1850 and in the west after 1900, when the frontier closed. The divinity of the Constitution was unheard of when the Constitution was drafted and for many years thereafter. The widespread canonization of the document has come in the last few generations. The human nature principle was laid down before recent work in biology, psychology, and anthropology made it re irrelevant. And so it goes. Principles change from time to time, but normally lag far behind changes in the facts of the outside world. Men are doing things they do not believe in some decades ahead of believing in them. Many of us are now using oaths and swear words, but think it wrong to do so. A generation hence blasphemy will probably be merely a bore with no moral principle involved. Today, government provides work and money for the unemployed. This contravenes the principle of government interference and is regarded in high quarters as a lamentable necessity. necessity. A few years hence, it will almost certainly be accepted as sound theory. 
In semantic terms, a principle is a judgment involving high-order abstractions, normally without reference, difficult to test by experiment or operation, revered for itself as such. Some principles appear to make life more tolerable. A greater number have the opposite effect. By intoning principles, and particularly by saying that the application of this great ideal hurts me more than it does you, one can perform many unkind acts with a clear conscience. When we believe in the Malthusian explanation of the slums, the law of population growth makes them inevitable. Slums cease to trouble us. When we believe that the highest good is, balance, is a balanced budget, the misery of those cut from relief rolls is a secondary matter. When we are convinced that any worthy man can get a job, unemployment can be disregarded and measures to alleviate it can be opposed. A hypocritical person can use principles as smoke screens to further personal ends, but a sincere person often follows them blindly for their own sake, regardless of individual gains or losses. Thus, some employers who are opposed to labor unions on principle are prepared to lose millions of dollars rather than sully their ideals. What they personally lose society, they hope, will someday gain. Principles are often tangled up in practical application. A man named Paul Loguadici was sentenced for murder in the state of New York. Shortly before the sentence was to be carried out, he developed a psychosis. This made it clear that being insane, he could not be executed. He was morally incapable of distinguishing right from wrong, and so could not derive a salutary lesson from the execution. He was sent to a hospital and given kind and careful treatment for his malady. Thousands of dollars were spent on him over a period of ten years. Finally, by a miracle of psychiatric skill, he was cured. Obviously, he now knew right from wrong and must be executed. If he were turned loose, there would be no respect for the law. The death cha chamber was prepared. Governor Lehman, deficient in logic but long on human understanding, commuted the sentence to life imprisonment. Arnold believes that the history of principles is a succession of romantically unnecessary sacrifices of human life or comfort in their honor. The blood sacrifice ideas of the Aztecs comes to mind and the heresy uh, hunts of the Inquisition. Principles are not tools by which discoveries are made, for they tend to close the mind against free, free inquiry. When men observe the world in the light of ideals, which they consider sacred and timeless, they tend to develop priests rather than scientists. Egyptian priests were skilled embalmers, but they learned little practical physiology, for their operations were rigorously governed by ceremonial and precedent. A major reason why the social studies are so backward compared to the physical sciences, Arnold observes, is that the former are largely concerned with principles, the latter with experiments. The principles of Washington's farewell address are still considered sources of social wisdom. The methods of Washington's physician, however, are no longer studied. The social sciences look to the past, the physical sciences to the present. Economists, lawyers, students of government examine the lessons to be learned from history unmindful that the procession of events we call history is an ir irreversible process, that an event never exactly repeats itself is a cardinal concept of co scientists. Rational thinking uncontaminated by experiment compels the professors to seek rounded systems of doctrine and a smooth and consistent flow of absolutes. 
a court of law which achieves a desirable result in human terms by an inexact use of legal concepts arouses more criticism from legal scholars than a court which achieves a calamitous result in a learned way. The struggle to formulate principles which are sound, systematic, and consistent often leads to the building of utopias by reformers and to the defenses of abuses by conservatives. An engineer, on the other hand, is able to give an adequate explanation of what is wrong with a bridge which falls without blaming the girders that collapsed because they did not have the moral stamina to stand the strain. Most people are kind and humane in ordinary situations, but when a given reform becomes entangled with their principles, many of them turn cruel. Arnold observes sardonically that from a strictly humanitarian point of view, the best government is found in a modern hospital for the insane. Here, principles are at a minimum. The aim of the doctors is to make the patients as comfortable as possible, consistent with the physical facilities at their disposal and the current science of medicine, regardless of the patient's moral deserts. At this point, we locate the principle which Arnold would substitute for many now in vogue. Quote, the ideal that it is a good thing to make people comfortable if the means exist by which it can be done, unquote. The late Professor E.S. Robinson of Yale follows along a similar path. He notes in his Psychology and the Law four kinds of explanations which people give to justify their beliefs. Number one, the impulsive, much used by primitive man on the idea that any explanation was better than none. Number two, the authoritarian, it is so because the good book, the king or the medicine man, says it so. Number three, the rationalistic. It is so because I have reasoned it out in my head. The facts must fit this reasoning. If they do not, they are unimportant. Number four, the scientific. Here, the standard of validity is found in a world of stubborn and irresistible fact which originates outside the thinking process, but which offers a constant discipline and obligation to the honest intellectual life. In dealing with the physical world, the test of fact is generally accepted as supreme. In dealing with the world of social control, it is widely believed that there are other tests more to be respected, Authority, internal, consistency, rationalistic thinking, historic principles. To see the world as it is, says Robinson, rather than suffused with the rosy light of principles, is not an effort to get along without ideals, aims, and aspirations. It is an effort to make these purposes real, to make them attainable in concrete terms. High ideals can result in the Thirty Years' War between Catholic and Protestant, or they can result in the vital activities of the Red Cross. On the one side, death. On the other, life. With more looking outward and less looking inward, we might shift our behavior toward the Red Cross aid. Both Robinson and Arnold advance a strong case for mental fictions. They hold that without principles to guide them, most men would feel as naked as they would walking down the street without their clothes. Perhaps a collection of fictions is inevitable, but I confess I look forward to the day when we shall dispense with concepts not derived from careful observation and from the necessities of survival and well-being under the conditions of this earth. Nothing else can we know surely, and nothing else should be bowed down to, or so it seems to me. If Americans were devoid of rigid principles, it is conceivable that poverty would have been virtually liquidated about 1925, when mass production became a dominating element in the manufacture of goods, that the Great Depression would not have taken place, that the so-called Supreme Court crisis would not have arisen, that the labor situation would not have become acute, that the prospects of a war involving this country would be fantastically remote, 
that the Democratic and Republican parties would be extinct and that we could go peaceably about our business of improving our relations to the environment about us. This may be a little fantasy of my own, but I do somberly ask, why, if we must have principles, do many of them have to be so cruel in their tangible effects and so badly timed for what is happening in the real world now? I think one important answer is found in the structure of the language we use. Chapter 8. Meaning for Scientists Why is the work of Einstein constantly injected into this discussion? Is not semantics difficult enough to grasp without dragging in a scientist whom only a handful of men are said to understand? I sympathize with the harassed reader. For my own sake, as well as for his, I wish that in this particular study we could give modern physics a wide berth. But we cannot. We must face the music. I am not, however, going to take you far into technical depths, because among other reasons, I do not know enough. Einstein not only turned the physicists upside down, he also revolutionized certain aspects of human communication. A shock went around the world comparable to that produced by Darwin's theory of evolution. In the long run, relativity may prove a more important factor in language than in physics. Its impact has caused thoughtful men everywhere to look to their words, to question the validity of their concepts. In the domain of physics, chemistry, biology, relativity has been responsible for an unprecedented crop of young geniuses due to the sudden expansion of understanding which its concepts promote. To see the outside world primarily in terms of relations rather than in terms of absolute substances and properties seems to develop an intellectual keenness hitherto unknown. Rest on this thought for a moment. Since 1905, when relativity was first announced, and especially since the 1920s, when the quantum concept began to bulk large in physics, a gathering number of human beings ha have been thinking and communicating in ways more sure, more powerful than have any human beings before. The new weapon is so sharp that it sometimes wounds them. There is much to be done in reconciling certain aspects of relativity and quantum theories, but they have set out upon an adventure whose excitement and importance it is difficult to overestimate. Einstein separated the observer from the observed. He threw the ego out of physics. He derived a picture of the world relatively undeflected by the human senses. As a result, he produced the closest fit yet made to happenings in nature. To communicate what he had done, Einstein employed a mathematical language, the calculus of tensors, which, says E.T. Bell, threshes out the laws of nature, separating the observer's eccentricities from what is independent of him with the superb efficiency of a modern harvester. To measure anything accurately, a man must take a scaled rule, a clock, a telescope, or other instruments and make readings. Every reading depends on the finite velocity of light from meter stick to eye, and on the finite velocity of nerve currents from eye to cortex. Although the finite velocity of light was indicated more than two centuries ago, 1676, up to that time of Einstein, it was assumed that readings were instantaneous. Newton did not take into consideration the finite velocity of the ray of light from instrument to eye. Einstein did, and Newtonian physics had to be revised. Measurements were found to be distorted, especially measurements over long distances. Newton's rules of mechanics st still work in terrestrial magnitudes with close approximation, but his absolutes have lost their majesty. 
It was found that infinite velocity was but a polite way of speaking about blunders in observation. Einstein thus gave a new cast to meaning. He found the meaning of length no longer in absolute space, but in the operations by which the length of physical objects was determined. He checked the meaning of simultaneity by operations and found the concept untenable. It followed that absolute space and absolute time were metaphysical notions in our head. When operations were called for, the notions disappeared, to the acute dismay of the majority of physicists. This brings us to another matter of the first importance. If Einstein challenged the massed knowledge of the past, including the immortal Newton, and gave contemporary physicists several mental indigestion, why did they tolerate such brashness? Why did they not arise as one man and say, in effect, to thunder with you, Mr. Einstein? If I challenged the whole structure of money and credit, however persuasively, the economists and statesmen would say, to thunder with you, Chase, and turn on their heels. That would probably be the end of it. Einstein could not be dismissed because he was working within the rigor of the scientific method. I could be dismissed because scientific method is unknown in the domain of money and credit. There is no standard by which sane men can agree that I am wrong or right. Honest scientists applied standards of proof to Einstein's findings, and much as it pained their inner feelings, they had to agree that he was right. If and when Homo sapiens perish from this planet, I hope that some creature somewhere will remember that once men climbed to this high place, a few members of the race acknowledged a discipline which made them bow. Because they knew that it was true to something that in their hearts they hated, Science does not consist of gentlemen with Van Dyke beards in white coats squinting down microscopes as per the toothpaste advertisements headed Science Says. Science is actually a high-order abstraction and cannot say anything. A given scientist may speak from time to time, judiciously or unjudiciously, as the case may be. The scientific method, or what a scientist does, may be described in some such terms as these to follow E.T. Bell. Number one, the central position is held by experiment. The experiment must be conducted under rigidly standard conditions so that another trained man can repeat it. If A claims that he has raised a four-month's corpse from the dead, he must describe his procedure so that B can revivify another corpse or prove to the world on A's own say-so that A was mistaken, to use no harsher term. Number two, next comes a tying up of experiments into bundles having one or more characteristics in common, a period of classification. Number three, from the group of experiments, deductions or conclusions are then drawn. Many scientists stop here, but some of them begin to believe in the ghostly existence of classes as entities and thus fall out of science into philosophy. Number four, laws or generalizations may then be attempted, such as Newton's law of gravity. The laws of nature are not mosaic tablets, but practical rules for human action with nature. Obey them or get into trouble. Another standard procedure among scientists is to construct from the facts available a hy hypothesis or hunch. State it frankly as a hypothesis, or better, keep it to yourself. Then arrange a series of experiments by which the hypothesis can be proved or disproved. As in the case of the revivified corpse, other investigators must be able to repeat the experiments and check the proof. 
This was essentially Einstein's procedure. He got an idea, he expressed it in a mathematical language, arrived at the shattering hypothesis of re relativity, and called for the experimental proof. It is interesting to follow the course of that proof. Among other predictions which arose from the hypothesis, three were held to be of primary importance. Number one, that the motion of the perihelion of Mercury must be approximately 42.9 seconds a century. Number two, that a ray of light coming from a distant star must be bent as it passed the sun at an angle of approximately 1.745 seconds. Number three, that the displacement of certain lines in the solar spectrum ought to be approximately 0 0.008 angstrom units. Many experiments have been made, and as the measurements have grown more precise, the results have approached more closely to the predictions. The motion of the perihelion of Mercury has been verified with high precision. Measurements of the angle of bending light rays near the Sun are now down to 1.72 seconds, with a probable error of 0.11 seconds plus or minus. The displacement of lines in the spectrum is down to 0 0.009 units, where the prediction called for 0 0.008. The, the hypothesis was thus proved correct within the limits of current knowledge, which is enough to expect. But relativity was not made into eternal truth. Good scientists were through with eternals. Relativity was simply the truest picture of certain aspects of the world yet discovered. In 1938, it still remains so. In 1988, it may be superseded by a concept which, which shows a closer fit. Darwin, Pasteur, and Chamberlain also began with preliminary hypotheses, which were later verified in whole or in part. Unverified remainders go down the drainpipe with the dishwater. Here is a scientist investigating a contagious fever. He wants to find out how the disease is transferred from one victim to the next. First, he browses around in the literature of contagious diseases. In time, he gets an idea that it might be conveyed by some blood-sucking creature. By prolonged and painstaking research in the field and in the laboratory in which many blood-sucking creatures are examined and discarded, he finally verifies the hypothesis. The mosquito is found guilty. Any competent man can repeat the experiment and prove it. A conquest has been made far greater than that of Cortez. Look at another picture for the sake of contrast. A devoted socialist asks if the misery caused by poverty can be cured. Long experience with poor people and rich people leads him to the hypothesis that capitalism is at fault. He cannot verify it by any conclusive experiment which another man can check, so he argues and affirms that capitalism is the mosquito. It may be so. But his only support is a series of scattered observations, logic in his head, and goodwill in his heart. Scientific knowledge moves steadily forward. Social reform plunges, rears, falls back to plunge again. The scientist finds his reference and makes positive that others can find them in the dark. The reformer can seldom locate his reference even if there are any to be found. I have tried to be a reformer, and I ought to know. The scientific method is concerned with how things do happen, not how they ought to happen. Knowledge of the way things do happen, with no ifs, ands, or buts, allows us to deal more effectively with our environment. The method is no more an exclusive matter for professionals than it is a matter of white coats and goggles. Most of us are amateur scientists today, though we are seldom aware of it. You are driving along a strange road and become lost. In what direction are you going? The sun is shining. You look at shadows cast by telephone poles and then look at your watch. It is near noon, so the shadows must run approximately north and south. The operation is crude, but it saves gasoline. 
I am waging war on tent caterpillars in my orchard. I douse a nest with kerosene. Then one of similar size beside it, I paint lightly with kerosene. Next day, I look to see if the second method is as effective as the first in killing caterpillars. If it is, I use it on the other nests and so save time in kerosene. This is a crude, controlled experiment. The scientific method is not primarily a matter of lab laboratories and atom smashers or even meter sticks. It is a way of looking at things, a way of gathering from the world outside knowledge, which will stay put and not go wandering off like the wickets in Alice's cro croquet game. Greek philosophers argued bitterly about what water was. People today no longer become angry and take sides as to the composition of water. Agreement has been reached and the mind rests. We no longer burn witches as responsible for the outbreak of plague. We burn up the cables for antitoxins and the Red Cross. Every spring the Nile came down and washed out the field boundaries of the ancient Egyptians. It was a damn nuisance. Whose field was where? This question marked the beginning of surveying and geometry. First, the Egyptians had to agree that the problem was worth attacking. Second, they had to see the possibility of a solution on which sane men could agree. Third, the solution had to be such that other sane men, then and in the future, proceeding by the rules laid down, could reach similar conclusions from the given facts. A's field was here, B's was there, and no more quarrels and uncertainties. According to Bell, these steps of agreeing to agree and producing a set of rules on which sane men could agree and obtain similar results, quote, were the most important ever taken by our race, unquote. By the scientific method, men are brought to agreement. In it, emotion and passion have no place. The degree of emotion displayed by a disputant observes Bertrand Russell is a direct indication of his lack of knowledge of the subject at issue. At the stage of unproved hypothesis, scientists can let themselves go to squabble and scratch, but when the experimental proof comes in, they must cease their bickering and remove their hats. The fact has always been for the physicist the one ultimate thing from which there is no appeal and in the face of which the only possible attitude is a humility almost religious. On the Nature of Concepts Let us look more closely into the new meaning suggested by Einstein's work. A synonym for the word meaning is the word concept. Scientists prefer the latter term. The lines quoted above about the authority of the fact were written by P.W. Bridgman of Harvard. In this section, we will follow the development of concepts as set forth in his Logic of Modern Physics. Wherever scientists are struggling with new forms of meaning, this book is known and respected. It is perhaps the clearest statement yet produced of how a scientist to today orders or should strive to order his intellectual equipment. Quote, our understanding of nature is non-existent apart from our mental processes, so that, strictly speaking, no aspect of psychology or epistemology is without pertinence, unquote. Thus, semantics takes a front seat at the beginning of the performance. Broadly speaking, modern science is concerned with two techniques of parallel importance. Number one, instruments for conducting experiments, and number two, language with which to explain the experiments. Both techniques have been refined and are constantly improved. How do we get facts into our heads and form concepts? Einstein shattered a whole cosmology of concepts. Let us not be knocked galley west again, says Bridgman. The attitude of the physicist must be one of pure empiricism, recognizing no a priori 
principles or absolutes which determine or limit new experience. Experience is determined only by experience. This means that we must give up the demand that the world outside be embraced in any one formula, either simple or complicated. It may turn out that nature can be so embraced, but thinking must be organized not to demand it as a necessity. Concepts must be so ordered that present experience does not exact hostages of the future. After Newton's great work, the door to certain new concepts was firmly shut, and when Einstein broke out the side of the house, the faculty nearly froze to death. Keep the door open and get used to fresh air. Before Einstein, concepts in physics were usually defined in terms of properties. In Book 1 of Newton's Principia, we read, Absolute, true, and mathematical time of itself and from its own nature flows equably without regard to anything external and by another name is called duration. Unquote. Time is something in and of itself. But, says Bridgman, if we examine the definition of absolute time in the light of experience, we find nothing in nature with such properties. Even a layman can check this statement. Try to think of time as an entity and you will be almost as baffled as in the case of the eternal. You can think of the face of a clock, of what occurred yesterday, or of watching Jesse Owens break the world's record for the 220-yard dash. You can think of specific times, but of no universal. Scientists observe local times on the Earth or extended times in the stellar depths. A light year is a measurement standard in extended time, but it connotes space traversed in a year's time. We must not talk about the age of a beam of light, says Bridgman, though the concept of age is one of the simplest derivations of local time here on Earth. We must not allow ourselves to think of events taking place as Arcturus now with the connotations attached to events taking place here now. It is difficult to inhibit this habit of thought, but we must learn to do it. P. Le Comte du Nuit has recently observed... At different ages, it takes different lengths of time to accomplish the same amount of work, and, as everyone realizes, the physiological significance of a day is not identical for insects and for animals that live to be 60 years old. Everything occurs as if side rail time flowed four times faster for a man of 50 than for a child of 10. Do you remember the endless days of childhood? Our biological processes shift with age and an hour is a different thing to a child and to an adult. Bridgman develops various concepts for length in post-Einsteinian terms, where an absolute property length has been dropped overboard. We can talk for years about what length means and not arrive anywhere. To find meaning, we must heave out of our armchairs, secure some meter sticks or other instruments, and with our hands perform certain operations. Follow carefully now, for we are coming to the operational approach, so cardinal to semantic understanding. The concept of length is fixed when the operations by which length is measured are fixed. The concept involves as much as a set of operations and no more. Applying this to absolute time, we find no way to measure it. No operation can be performed in respect to it. Into operations involving time, other factors enter, preventing isolation. We cannot say that absolute time either does or does not exist only that no operations yet found can measure it, and so the concept as of 1938 is meaningless. 
concepts not subject to operations are meaningless. Speculations about an expanding universe, the curve of entropy, that is, that the universe is running down like a wound watch, are meaningless because no experiment can yet measure the phenomena. Such speculations fall under the head of extrapolation, which means taking a few points on a curve and riding the line which joins them to cloud cuckoo land. It is exhilarating mental exercise and quite all right if you know that it is cloud cuckoo land. If you become serious about it, you may wake up some morning to find yourself a public laughing stock. We take our meter stick and measure a house lot. This is a simple operation and gives us one concept for length. Next, we stand out in front of the house lot and measure a trolley car moving down the street. The car, unlike the house lot, is not at rest and the operations have to change. We have to allow for velocity. When the trolley car stops, measuring operations are similar to those for the house lots. But when it begins to move, length becomes a function of velocity, and so time gets into the concept. We now want to measure the distance between the sun and the planet Jupiter. To do so, we have to throw away our meter sticks and take two telescopes. Length is no longer tactual, but optical. New operations are demanded and therefore new concepts. To say that a star is 10 to the 5th light years distance is actually and conceptually a different kind of thing than to say that a telegraph pole is 100 feet away. Turning and going down the scale from stars to molecules, we find that other instruments and operations are needed. And so the concept of length must shift, shift again. Presently, the measuring gauges are found to be atomic in structure, without clear boundaries. At very short lengths, the concept merges into the field equations of electricity. Long and short are terms showing relations, usually relative to a man. Thus, length is not something which an object possesses as a man possesses a shirt. It is a word in our heads. Its meaning is determined by what we do rather than by what we say, and the concept sh shifts with our doing. To use the same label, length, for these various concepts, says Bridgman, may be convenient, but it is always dangerous and perhaps costs too much in terms of ambiguity. Some great thinker is likely to turn it into stone at any moment, declaring that length is length, now and forever, and let there be no more nonsense about it. The operational approach makes knowledge about the world outside no longer absolute, but relative. The operation is performed relative to some standard, say the gauge or the meter stick. Concepts emerge from these operations which are definite and verifiable. Another man can perform the operation and check the concept. Concepts, observe, observes Bridgman, must be constructible out of the materials of human experience and workable within that experience. When concepts move beyond the reach of experience, they become unverifiable hypotheses. Knowledge advances when we find how things are related and in what order. This ties in with Korzybski's central idea of knowledge as structural. In Chapter 1, we noted that the operational approach renders meaningless such qu great questions as, May space be bounded? It clears the air of scores of questions which have bemused or tortured thinkers for thousands of years. Try it yourself. Pose a great question. Say, is man a free agent or is his course fatalistically determined? 
Look for an operation which can answer it. Keep on looking. Look under the bed, out in the garage, everywhere except in your, your own mind. In the end, you will find that no operation is possible, and the question to date is meaningless. You can argue about it if it amuses you, but neither you nor your opponent can know anything about it, at least not yet. A hundred years ago, the question, is man a product of evolution, was in a similar fix. Along came Darwin and Wallace, and by a series of operations, experiments, and deductions, fixed the concept of evolution, gave the question meaning, and conclusively answered it in the affirmative. Observe that clocks and meter sticks were not much used by Darwin, but careful observations and descriptions of a qualitative rather than a quantitative character. Length to a physicist is no longer a property to be applied to any object anywhere at any time. It is a series of concepts. Length 1, house lots. Length 2, moving trolley cars. Length 3, solar distances. Length 4, atoms. As many concepts as there are different operations. It may be objected that this is all very confusing. On the contrary, it was the old one-valued concept of length which furnished the confusion. When Einstein broke it open, knowledge jumped forward. The new concepts worked. What a floodlight this throws on the notion of consistency. Consistent with what? Where? When? To use the house lot concept of length in stellar distances just to be consistent brings useful knowledge to a standstill. To use local time concepts in the field of extended time just to be consistent makes one an anti-Einsteinian today and something of an ignoramus. Similarly, to lay down the concept of free speech as practiced in America on Asiatic peoples who have never experienced the American variety of vocal liberty is consistent, if you like, but meaningless. Consistency is a jewel if you keep it in similar contexts. If you go leaping into other times and other places, it turns to paste in colored glass. No statesman can be consistent if conditions change while he is in office. Ignorant of the semantic idea involved, he spends sleepless nights worrying about it and is constantly pretending that he is a paragon of consistency. Meanwhile, nothing so fires the literary talents of a newspaper editor as to catch the great man being inconsistent. The statesman should refresh his courage from Walt Whitman. Quote, do I contradict myself? Very well, then, I contradict myself. Unquote. In addition to length, time, space, Bridgman describes modern concepts of velocity, force, mass, energy, temperature, light, quantum theory, identity, causality, all within the framework of operations. We have not time, or if you prefer, we have not space, to examine them in any detail here. If the reader feels his curiosity aroused, he is earnestly ad advised to go to the original source. Poincaré has spoken of the baleful effect of the word heat on physics. As it was grammatically classified among substances, physicists spent centuries looking for something in the outside world corresponding to heat, and quite neglecting the three pails of water described in chapter 6. Heat is a symbol not for a thing, but for a relation. Here is a bar of steel. A thermometer shows its temperature to be 60 degrees. One asks... What is the temperature of an electron in the bar? I answer smartly, 60 degrees. You answer more wisely, I don't know. We are both in error. 
We have not shifted our talk to the electronic level. Temperature, by scientific definition, depends on molecular vibration. And to have temperature at all, there must be at least two molecules. An electron is below this level and so has nothing to be called temperature in its makeup. We never experience light by itself as a thing. Our experience deals only with things lighted. Therefore, light as an object traveling is very difficult to prove, and to date is more hypothesis than observed fact. Einstein assumed that light does travel by itself, but this concept may have to be modified. In the realms of quantum phenomena, behavior within the atom, the ordinary concepts of mechanics are inapplicable. So also are relativity mechanics. Electrons do not whirl like iron wheels. This is a new kind of experience. Like the kitten, we must be still, observe, and gradually form new concepts. Indeed, the laws of mechanics may be only the statistical gross effect of quantum activity, the aggregate action of a great many elementary quantum processes. I am not giving these illustrations in an attempt to teach you physics, to explain relativity, or to parade my grasp of science. I know very little about physics, but I am enormously interested in finding out how physicists handle concepts. Above other men in recent years, they have widened the boundaries of human knowledge. Forget the physics recited here, for it is negligible, but do not forget the way a modern physicist forms a concept. Above all, do not forget the operational approach. Let us now turn to the problem of how scientists communicate what they discover. Quote, the essence of an explanation, says Bridgman, consists in reducing a situation to elements with which we are so familiar that we accept them as a matter of course so that our curiosity rests, Unquote. When you explain a thing to me and I understand it, what you have said checks with my past experience as per the filing system in my brain. Yes, sir, that's a thingamabob, all right. I've seen a carload of them. An explanation calls up a familiar correlation, but it is by no means absolute truth. Its validity depends on the hearer's experience, which may be limited. Perhaps I have never encountered a thingamabob. Perhaps I have misinterpreted it. The explanation that a thunderstorm is caused by an angry god may be good enough for a Trobriand islander. It is not good enough for a physicist. Bridgman notes three steps in reacting to new experiences. Number one, if the experiment is not too far beyond the margin of known ground, it can be explained in concepts derived from past experience. Thus, the kinetic theory of ga gases slid into focus without trouble. Number two, if the experiment is well beyond the margin, an explanatory crisis develops. Relativity and quantum theory produced such crises. The human impulse is to force the new into the old molds and thus feel mentally relieved. Einstein has discovered nothing new. Newton said it all long ago. Such unwarranted explanations are pleasant for a time, but sooner or later they will be found out. Society will not be able to demand permanently from the individual the acceptance of any conviction or creed which is not true, no matter what the gain in other ways to society. Reading this, I suddenly feel relieved about the fraudulent concepts, racial and national, which Hitler is trying to foist upon the people of Germany. Sooner or later, their falsity will destroy them. Number three, the explanatory crisis can be faced squarely. 
just as the kitten faces it with cautious investigation and an open mind. All our knowledge is in terms of experience. We should not expect or desire to erect an explanatory structure dif different in character from that of experience. But only bigots, unimaginative, obtuse, and obstinate demand that all experience must conform to familiar types. Some physicists are still afflicted with this bigotry. Why? partly because they were brought up on Newton and the splendor of his mechanical laws, partly because they are still slaves to bad language. But just as the old monks struggled to subdue the flesh, so must the physicists struggle to subdue this sometimes nearly irresistible but perfectly unjustifiable desire. If physicists must become ascetics against the lures of absolutes, imagine the travail of a poor economist inured to little but wind for a lifetime. The Great Depression of 1929 was a slice of new experience as gigantic as it was tragic. Almost unanimously, the economics faculty energetically supported by President Hoover announced that the Depression was nothing new, that we had had plenty of them before. Look at 1837 and 1893, that the same curve was always followed and that it would probably all be over in 90 days. This forcing of the new into the mold of the old, this yearning for the familiar explanation persisted throughout the catastrophe. For millions of Americans, it is unshaken to this day. When President Roosevelt, like a modern physicist, tried to meet new experience with new experiment, he suffered an avalanche of bitter protest. The voters with small incomes were the scientists in the premises. Most of them kept on voting to allow him to seek new concepts for new experiences. Physicists are continually hunting for the fundamental bricks of the universe. It was recently thought that such a brick had been found in electrical charges. There is no justification for this tidy view, no experimental proof. The necessary operations have not been performed. The theory of relativity holds reasonably well for large dimensions in the outside world. The quantum theory holds reasonably well for small dimensions. At the borderland, the two theories clash, so the dogmatist leaps to the conclusion that both must be wrong and that modern physics cannot be taken seriously. But just why must the universe be explained by one consistent universal law? Suppose it does not act that way in fact. Suppose that large-scale and small-scale events do follow different patterns. Suppose that we do live in several kinds of space at the same time. The fact that our minds want simple laws is no reason for supposing that nature must be simple. Will the concept work? Can another man repeat the operation? Here lies the determining factor for knowledge. Attempts to simplify nature and reduce it to general laws have had a gloomy history. Newton's mechanics, gravitation, thermodynamics, the principle of similitude, the theory of ultimate rational units are useful in certain contexts, but they do not unveil the whole world outside. The task of finding concepts which shall adequately describe nature and at the same time be easily handled by us is the most important and difficult of physics, and we never achieve more than approximate and temporary success. Fortunate it is that nature does happen to disclose some simple approximate rules over certain classes of phenomena that are good enough to allow us to build boulder dams and x-ray tubes. I wish we had some simple rules at least half as accurate to guide us in economics and politics.
What is the ultimate nature of matter? The question we know by now is meaningless. It would make laymen as well as physicists feel better to answer it, even as the idea of God makes some people feel better. How does the outside world work in a given context, approximately? That seems to be the sum and quest of human knowledge. It will give us much power over the environment as we are competent to handle. I have taught you very little physics, but I trust I have told you enough to make it clear that Einstein has not shunted science into ghostly realms where, quote, everything is electricity, electricity is unknown, therefore everything is unknown, where science has banished materialism and spiritualism has returned to the hearts of men, unquote. Gibberish of this nature has been prevalent when non-scientific people have discussed modern physics. It is a mixture of ignorance, wishful thinking, and bad language. By getting rid of absolutes, the scientific method stands on the firmest ground in its history. It is sad that some of the older scientists cannot give up their fixed ideas and accept the gain which has been made. Einstein brought us closer to the world outside, thrusting aside the barriers of the observer's senses. We have a like task in the social studies, the outside world of behaving human beings. Our problem is to see Germany, see Spain, see big business, see money and credit, see poverty and unemployment. See modern technology, not as entities walking, but as their reference, really order themselves. Our task is to thrust aside dogma, one-valued judgments, untenable identifications, and so come closer to what is actually going on behind our skins. We cannot, alas, bring these matters into the laboratory as the scientists can bring cosmic rays. But we can learn to use our minds like scientists. We can adopt the operational approach. We can appreciate the flexibility of concepts. We can avoid fraudulent explanations of the new in terms of the old. Above all, we can strive for the great discipline of agreement. By long and painful experience, I have learned that a tennis ball goes harder and straighter to its destination when one has a rocking balance, swaying from foot to foot like a dancer, with muscles flexible and relaxed. When a rigid position is taken, muscles tense, weight firmly planted on both feet, the fearful wallop one gives the ball usually sends it over the backstop or lamely into the net. We need flexible concepts as well as flexible bodies to meet the outside world. Modern physics has rung down the curtain on absolutes. Scientists now devote themselves more to cutting into the margin of the unknown than to framing eternal laws. The semantic discipline has a kindred aim. It is not an absolute, but only a useful method for cutting into the margin of opaque language, making communication clearer. It cannot clear up all talk. There are blind spots in Korzybski, in Ogden, in Bridgman. The book you are reading has many of them. Presently, on these foundations, somebody will come along and give the study another forward push, progressively narrowing the margin of the unknown. Chapter 9. The Language of Mathematics Your grandfather leaves $5,000 to you and your sister. The will provides that she is to receive $650 more than you receive. How will you tell her how much she is to get? In ordinary language, you can shuffle the figures around and after a time find the answer. But by using mathematical language, you can communicate the news much more quickly and accurately. Let X be your share. Then X plus 650 is her share. Both shares are equal $5,000. 
Mathematics has been called the language of science. This is not quite accurate. Each branch of science has also an argot of its own, and as we have seen, even physicists often use ordinary language like the rest of us. Some scientific concepts, however, cannot be communicated except in mathematical terms. This is the case with the central concept of relativity. You must know some calculus to grasp it and make it your own. Many books have been advertised as reducing Einstein to simple terms which any intelligent layman can understand. Strictly speaking, the blurb, if not the book, is fraudulent. One does not understand a story in Russian just because it is written in words of one syllable. A similar situation holds for quantum theory. Ordinary language is not adapted to describe processes within the atom. It is adapted to deal with everyday processes involving exceedingly large numbers of atoms. To talk about what is happening inside one atom, a special language is required. Must we all turn mathematicians then to understand our world? No, but two important observations are in order. For some of the more complicated aspects of nature, mathematics provides the only key. For everyday activities in the power age, mathematics provides a very useful aid to clear thinking. Even if one does not master higher mathematics, a knowledge of what this language is about, how it developed, and the ability to handle a little algebra and geometry to plot a few simple graphs is worth having. It helps to solve many problems of communication and meaning. One of the most pleasant ways I know to obtain this knowledge is to read Lancelot Hogben's Mathematics for the Million. It is not guaranteed painless, but the fact that it has been an outstanding bestseller both here and in England is evidence of its human and practical value. Mathematics, he says, begins in the nomadic age to fill a need. It was necessary to count herds and flocks to keep them straight. When agriculture was developed, it became essential to measure croplands. We have already noted how the Nile washed out boundary marks every spring and encouraged a science of land measure or geometry. Recurring seasons for planting, harvesting, high water periods demanded an accurate calendar and for this astronomical measurements had to be taken. Many of the first writings were calendar notations. I have seen beautiful examples of such stone writings on Maya stele in Mexican jungles. As cities grew, timekeeping became essential and mathematics was broadened to count the hours. The building of temples, especially pyramids, required careful measurements and a geometry of solids. How much stone must be quarried for a truncated pyramid of such and such size? What corn and wine were bartered or sold, standard measurements were essential so that neither party would be defrauded. Presently, galleys and ships began to take journeys beyond sight of land and navigation was demanded. How human this is! Some heavy thinker of ancient times did not begin by sitting in his portico and evolving numbers and planes and truncated pyramids out of his head to plague children in schoolrooms forevermore. The numbers and planes came out of the need of shepherds, farmers, traders, builders, out of the day-by-day -day life of the people. They came without mystery, but not without a kind of mental revolution. Bertrand Russell has observed that it must have taken many ages to discover that a brace of partridges in a couple of days are both instances of the number of two. Certain Greek philosophers took this useful tool and made a dull fetish out of it. They lifted it from the marketplace and put it in the cloister. They believed bedrock had been reached when they had isolated a point, a line, an angle, something changeless, timeless, eternal. 
From these absolutes, truth could be reared by reason. The intellectuals of Athens and Alexandria rarely examined the sort of things about which these words can be intelligently used. They dealt with pure theory, not with a living world. In Euclid, the analysis of flatness reached its climax so perfect and often so unreal that it has been a major educational subject ever since. No wonder so many schoolboys are bored by a geometry. It connects with nothing in their experience, and no meaning comes through. Euclid was a great man, and his geometry is useful in limited contexts. The objection raised by Hogben is to the worship of Euclid's valuable findings as truth, good everywhere, for everything, at all times. The word worship is used advisedly. A noted divine once wrote a book proving to his own satisfaction that if you destroy Euclid, you necessarily destroy the revealed word of God. Nobody can destroy Euclid. All that can be done is to put his work in the place where it functions and keep it out of places where it does not function. If Einstein had stuck to Euclidean geometry, relativity would never have been heard of. Pythagoras formulated some excellent mathematics more than a century before Euclid. He also made a major contribution to the technique of human knowledge by working out the concept of proof. He insisted that assumptions or postulates must first be set down clearly. No extraneous matter must be subsequently introduced. Proof is arrived at by applying close deductive reasoning to the postulates. Having thus immortalized himself, Pythagoras went off into the blind alley of magic numbers and founded a whole school which stood in awe of the portents and omens of sevens and elevens. Bless us, divine number, thou who generatest gods and men. Some people today still cower before the number 13. The abacus, or counting frame, was invented to do sums in addition, subtraction, multiplication, and division. One can still see this device in active use in Russia or at a Chinese laundry. It consists of little balls on wires which one pushes around, carrying over from one line to the next. The ancients did not know how to do sums on paper. Fractions were avoided, decimal points unheard of. One counted on one's fingers or used the abacus. It was tedious work. Not until long after the fall of the Roman Empire did Western countries adopt the Arabic zero. The sign for the empty column of numbers together with the rudiments of algebra. The zero and Ar Arabic numerals produced a revolution more important than that of the printing press. They liberated mankind from the prison bars of the abacus. The revolution was not, however, unopposed. An edict of 1259 forbade the bankers of Florence to use the infidel symbols. The bankers must still write four characters for eight, six characters for 48, 15 for 3,888. But by using pencil, paper, and the decimal point, which the zero permitted, merchants could solve in minutes sums which used to take hours. The electric adding machine is a great improvement over pencil and paper, but it is as nothing compared to the improvement in mental machinery provided by the zero. Observe also that the algebra is direct shorthand translation of longhand talk, a tidier, defter language, not something incomprehensible out of the sky. Slang sometimes performs a similar service. Rather than disperse yourselves as rapidly as possible, the American policeman remarks laconically, Scram! 
When early observers could not readily express their measurements in everyday language, they were driven to experiment with symbols. If further observations were inexpressible in the symbols available, new symbols were sought. Thus, Newton was stumped to tell the world, or even himself, what he had discovered about the movement of celestial bodies until he had perfected the differential calculus, which is an admirable language for accurately expressing movement. Thus, Gauss was forced to perfect coordinates and the integral calculus. So... Lobachevsky, in 1826, invented symbols to express non-Euclidean geometry. So Einstein applied and improved the calculus of tensors, not to drive us crazy, but to meet a genuine need. We noted earlier how everyday language has developed by a process of filling the gaps, supplying a new word to take the place of a long, clumsy description. Mathematics has followed a similar course. Furthermore, as Bell points out, one significant fact stares us in the face. Mathematics is the in inexhaustible matrix of new development in the art of thinking. When it declines, close reasoning petrifies into stereotyped and unimaginative repetition of the classics. The Middle Ages was such a period of petrification. Hogben calls ordinary speech a language of sorts and mathematics a language of size. The writing of sort language was once a mystery closely monopolized by priests. The time has come, he says, for another reformation like that of 500 years ago when the priestly monopoly was broken and the mass of the people were permitted to read the Bible and learn to write themselves. Most people today can neither read nor write size language, yet the world they live in depends upon it. Without mathematics, there would be no electric power, no steel bridge, bridges, no public statistics, no railroads, automobiles, or telephones. Without the theory of analytic functions, we could not study temperatures or the flow of electricity and so control them. Without multidimensional geometry, we could not construct automobile engines or deal with gases under pressure. We need to know at least the rudiments of mathematics and sheer self-defense. No society is safe in the hands of priests. Think of the mathematical accompaniment of our daily life timetables, unemployment figures, insurance based on actuarial computations, taxes, debts, interest, wage rates, pensions, old age security, legislation, bond yields, speed limits, betting odds, baseball averages, football gaining and scoring, calories, weights, temperatures, rainfall, meter readings, radio wavelengths, tire pressures, freight charges, calculation of flood crests, birth rates, death rates. Little of this was essential in Athens, Alexandria, or Rome. With greater urgency than ever before, the mathematician and the plain man need to understand each other. Without a knowledge of the grammar of size and order, we cannot hope to plan an age of plenty. Priests and pundits will prove that it cannot be done, and we shall have to submit unless we know the hocus-pocus in the proof. Modern engineering is possible because of the similarity in structure between mathematics and the outside world. With confidence, we rely upon the structural abstractions which engineers employ to build skyscrapers, bridges, motor cars, and airplanes. A large part of modern behavior, many social institutions are dependent upon the engineer's ability to predict what will happen when steel and stone and chemicals are combined thus and so. Without such sureness, bridges might collapse, boulder dams might fail. Upon predictability of this nature, modern civilization has been built. Predictability, observes Dr. D. G. Campbell, 
depends upon the discovery of structure, the representation of that structure by a language with similar structural characteristics, and then the manipulation of the symbols of that language to determine what will happen under the conditions of such structural arrangements in the future. It is like a miniature stage used by a stage designer to study lights and color, like a wind tunnel for testing airplane design, like the tank which Starling Burgess uses for testing models of cup defender yachts. A mathematician, for instance, predicts torsion stresses in a steel bar by measuring stresses in a soap film in which he finds characteristics of similar structure. Relationships are similar and may be represented by mathematical symbols of relationship. Laborious methods of trial and error become unnecessary. From a few measurements, structure in the soap film is discovered. A language corresponding to the structure is utilized. Predictability of the behavior of steel bars is made. But no man alive predicted the Great Depression of 1929 with any structural knowledge to support him, and no man knows surely when the next collapse will come. Let us follow Hogben in a few simple exercises in translating mathematics into ordinary language. Area equals length times breadth. In the language of mathematics, this sentence reads A equals L times B. X and equal are the verbs in this expression, while the nouns are A, L, and B. Observe the saving in time and space. Observe further that in algebraic symbols of this kind, no actual objects, no reference in the world outside are included. Mathematics is a language of action and relation, but it is easy to supply reference for the sentence above by measuring your kitchen floor in square units. The equation gives orders and relations which must be obeyed. You are not to multiply area by length to get breadth. You follow the rules. Then it is possible to substitute yards or feet or kilometers to apply to oblongs anywhere within the confines of this length concept and get an answer for what you want to know. You must be careful, however, to deal in similar units, always yards or always kilometers in this equation. You must not multiply yards by kilometers, must not add yards to gallons, or you will create a mathematical monster. Before you know it, you will be preparing indices of wholesale prices for the guidance of economic economists and statesmen. Everyday language contains gerunds or noun and verb combined in one word as in working. Gerunds are also found in mathematics in symbols such as negative 3 or the square root of negative i, which are numbers with direction attached to them by convention. We find conjunctions for therefore and because the symbols. The verbs plus and minus were originally chalked on bales in warehouses to show surplus or short weight. In using these verbs with reference attached, we must again be careful not to add or subtract dissimilar things. Two boys plus ten green apples do not foot up to anything except possibly a couple of stomach aches. This warning has been called the rule of quantitative similarity. There are collective nouns in mathematics, but nothing corresponding to the high-order abstractions in everyday language. Capital letters of the alphabet are used like A or M to symbolize whole families of numbers having something definite in common. Area or A must translate into square units, inches or feet or kilometers. This makes it difficult to create fictional entities without observable reference. 
Mathematics is a powerful corrective for the spook-making of ordinary language. The term elegant is frequently applied to mathematical style. It means that rotundities have been removed by the process of elimination. In the international language of mathematics, we sacrifice everything to make the statement as clear as possible. Suppose we translate into mathematics the famous problem with which Zeno baffled the Greek logicians. Zeno said that if Achilles allowed a tortoise a head start in a race, no matter how much faster Achilles ran, he could never overtake the tortoise. Why? Because he must first reach the place where the tortoise was when Achilles started. By the time he reaches it, the tortoise, however slow, has made some prog progress. So Achilles must reach this second place. But by the time he gets there, the tortoise has moved to a third place, still ahead, and so on ad infinitum. The distance between them ever narrows, but Achilles can never overcome it. When last seen, to paraphrase Bell, the tortoise was point zero 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 five of an inch ahead, and Achilles' tongue was hanging out half a yard. Dealing in words alone, the logic is in unimpeachable. Let it whirl around your cortex from reference to symbol, and the chances are that you will be unable to discover anything wrong with it. You may settle yourself in an armchair and think until kingdom come or until you go mad, and you cannot get around it. But the moment you begin to look for a reference to perform an operation to place an actual turtle here and a young athlete there and start them off, the mental blockage dissolves. When I hear a problem of this nature, my impulse is to reach for a pencil and paper, and undoubtedly you share this impulse. It is a sign of semantic progress. The ancients had no scribbling paper and no adequate symbols for attacking such problems. They knew, of course, that Achilles could lick the tar out of the tortoise, but how were they to prove it? Here are two simple methods of translation unknown to the Greeks. In this mathematical language of graphs, we draw the rate at which the tortoise moves and the rate of Achilles, and where the two lines meet, the tortoise is overtaken. Assuming that the tortoise can run a yard a second, that Achilles runs ten times as fast and gives the tortoise a start of 100 seconds, they will meet 111.11 .11 yards down the track. It does not make any difference what rates are taken so long as the tortoise starts first and Achilles runs faster. The slope of the lines will change, but the meeting point will always appear. With the same assumptions, let us translate the problem into simple algebra. Let r be the rate of the tortoise, then Achilles' rate will be 10r. Let x be the time in seconds taken by the tortoise before they meet. We know that the distance traveled by the tortoise equals the distance traveled by Achilles. The distance a body travels is its rate of formula multiplied by the time traveled. They will meet 111.11 .11 seconds after the tortoise starts or 111.11 .11 yards down the course as in the graph. Incidentally, most algebra can be translated into graphs with curved lines for higher powers of x. Engineers are very partial to graph language. The Greeks had no algebra, no graphical methods, while the geometry of Euclid, which they did possess, dealt only in spaces and made no allowance for times. Motion, rates of motion, velocity could not be handled. So you see in what a predicament the logicians found themselves when Zeno, perhaps with an ironical smile, put the problem before them. At this point, a little journey through the fourth dimension with Bell may prove enlightening. Suppose you want to identify and label all the men in Middletown. For each man you ask, one, his age in years, two, his height in inches, three, his weight in pounds, four, dollars in his pocket or bank. You allot a symbol for each characteristic. 
A for age, H for height, W for weight, D for dollars, and rigorously maintain the order. Black, then, is 35 years old, 60 inches tall, weighs 160, and has two dollars. White is 42, 68 inches tall, weighs 135, and has ten thousand dollars. The set of labels A, H, W, D is a simple kind of four-dimensional manifold, a term which has long terrorized the non-mathematical. We can make it five-dimensional by adding S for size of shoe and six-dimensional by adding C for number of children and so on. Moving this idea over into the field of mechanics, we can set up ordered symbols for three distance measurements and one time measurement. With this four-dimensional manifold, the position of any particular object can be fixed at any particular instant. Consider a fly in a room. Let E be the east wall, N the north wall, F the floor, T the time after 12 o'clock. The units are inches and seconds. This means that the fly was 12 inches from the east wall, 2 inches from the north wall, 3 inches from the floor at 5 seconds after 12 o'clock. The next label might be 60, 136, 6, which you can translate yourself. By refining our observations to the limit of endurance, we could fit labels enough to describe the erratic flight of the fly for an hour with sufficient accuracy for all human purpose. This hour's history is a four-dimensional manifold by definition and gives us a useful method of describing the order of certain happenings in the outside world. It is meaningless to talk of the fourth dimension. We can construct as many dimensions in the manifolds of this kind as we wish. Yet, no sooner did relativity become news than a lady with a piercing eye undertook to tell the good people of Pasadena for a fee exactly how the fourth dimension would enable them to recapture their virility, their dividends, their faith in God, and their straying husbands or wives. Remember that fly, and do not cringe before the fourth dim dimension again. The relatively young science of agrobiology is an example of the usefulness of mathematics to farmers, to gardeners, and to the public in general. Observe the progression. First, Liebig determined by growing plants in earthenware pots, the various chemical substances e essential to plant life, phosphorus, potash, nitrogen, sulfur, magnesium, and the rest. Then Mitcherlich carried on the experiments to show the specific effect of each chemical on plant yields. For a pot of oats, no nitrogen resulted in no yield. 0.35 grams of nitrogen gave 80 grams of dried oat plant. 0.7 grams of nitrogen gave 120 grams of plant. 1.4 grams gave 150 and 3.5 grams 160. This was the end. No matter how much more nitrogen was added to the pot, the yield could not be raised above 160 grams. Now, when these figures are neatly tabulated and checked by scores of experiments, mathematics enters and a curve is plotted. Curves are similarly prepared for the effect on oats of potassium, phosphorus, and other chemicals. Measured quantities of water are applied and curves are prepared for that. When oats are finished, corn, wheat, roses, and other plants are grown in pots and their curves in turn are plotted. Presently, a law is derived. When we take as the unit of a growth factor that quantity of it that will produce 50% of the total yield, then each cumulative unit is only half as effective as the unit that went before. The more fertilizer you add, the greater the yield, this side of the limit, but at a diminished rate. It was once thought that plant growth went up in a straight line as fertilizer was added. Thus, the agrobiologist discovered 
with the aid of mathematics, a practical law of the utmost importance. They have done more. They have calculated the possible maximum yield of many plants and are prepared to do it for any plant that grows except the fungi, which follow different rules. The maximum yield of corn, for instance, is 225 bushels per acre. This quantity of corn has actually been raised. Agrobiology is already revolutionizing the art of growing things, and the future effects economic, political, and international promise to be epoch-making. It employs the language of mathematics to a great extent, and indeed would be non-existent without mathematics. Note carefully, however, that this machine does not run on air. It runs on pots of oats and corn. Mathematical language is also susceptible of ab abuse. It is not so widespread as the abuse of nord ordinary language, but it is serious enough. It takes various forms. Ever since numbers were invented, people have become intoxicated with their possible combinations and have gone off on magnificent ghost ca cases after mystical numbers. Numbers, of course, are nothing but useful symbols to fill gaps in meaning and communication. They originated in the human cortex and are unreported anywhere in nature. We have objectified them, as we have done with so many other symbols, into puissant forces in the outside world. Consider the vast amount of tosh erected around the number seven. The seven candlesticks, the seven deadly sins, the seven planets. In the year that Piazzi discovered Ceres, or planet number eight, Hegel wrote upbraiding the scientists for their neglect of philosophy. Philosophy, he said, had established seven as the only possible number of planets. Why waste time looking for more? Again, many men, including mathematicians, have failed to realize the limitations of the language. The technique is wonderfully useful for establishing relations and orders, but what are the things between which we desire to establish the relations? Mathematics is purely abstract and says nothing about that. Just to whirl relations about in the head may be an amusing method of killing time, but no knowledge is gained until concrete things are hitched to symbols. These objects must be carefully selected. A distinguished professor recently sent me a monograph in which calculus was solemnly applied to various kinds of consumer goods, such as potatoes and automobiles, including, if you please, subjective wants. Try to count anything in the real world corresponding to subjective wants. The result of all this fine mathematics, of course, was blob. Mathematics has been likened to a sausage machine. Feed it proper raw materials and turn the crank. Something useful, if not edible, comes out. Feed it nothing and turn the crank. There is much grinding of gears, but nothing comes out. Feed it scrap iron mixed with broken glass and the machine refuses to work. A good deal of what passes for pure mathematics consists in whirring the works with nothing edible inside. Meanwhile, the makers of various kinds of economic index numbers are feeding the sausage machine scrap iron and broken glass. Bertrand Russell has characterized pure mathematics as that science in which we neither know what we are talking about nor whether what we say is true. Always examine the data assumed. If the assumptions are without tangible validity, the mathematical theories deduced from them may scintillate with dazzling plausibilities, but they will be worthless. A dangerous abuse of mathematics appears in the practice of extrapolation, described earlier as riding a trend curve to cloud cuckoo land. Here, deductions are made from facts, but there are not enough facts. Example, the Earth will maintain vegetation for the next 5 million years. 
a wild guess. No operations are available except some crude data on the rate of the Earth's cooling. Another example. The New York metropolitan area will have a population of 21 billion by 1965. This is a more careful guess based on actual population trends prior to 1920. The fact of birth control, among others, was neglected, and it now looks as though the New York metropolitan population in 1965 would be far less than the original estimate. Be exceedingly carry of large generalizations under the caption, science says that universe is running down, or science says that universe is blowing up, or science says that in 10,000 years the human race will have lost its teeth. Some professor is probably making an extrapolating ass of himself. Bell furnishes a list of famous extrapolations about the age of the earth. Bishop Usher, 5,938 years. Lord Kelvin, 20 million to 40 million. Helmholtz, 20 million. G. H. Darwin, 57 million. J. Jolly, 80 million to 90 million. Jolly and Clark, 100 million. Assorted geologists, 2 billion. Assorted astronomers, 2 billion to 8 billion. Step right up, ladies and gentlemen, and pick your winner. Here is another choice item of extrapolation paraphrase from a book by Stuart and Tate, physicists of 50 years ago. Matter is made up of molecules, size A, which are vortex rings composed of lum luminiferous ether. The ether is made up of much smaller molecules, size B, Vortex rings in the sub-ether. This is the unseen universe. Here the human soul exists. It is made up of B molecules. It permeates the body like a gas. Thought is vibratory motion in the A molecules, but part of the vibration following the law of the conservation of energy will be absorbed by the B molecules, the soul. Therefore, the soul has memory. When the body dies, the soul keeps memory intact and becomes a free agent in the sub-ether. The physical possibility of the immortality of the soul is thus demonstrated. The volume in which this charming balderdash appeared was widely read in the 1870s and 1880s. Mathematics can do no more, explain no more, than the tangible things to which its symbols are hitched permit. Beyond this limit, it goes off the deep end and has no meaning. In the language of mathematics, no less than in ordinary language, we must find the referent for the symbols. There is no truth in the machinery of mathematics as such, only as an endless series of tautologies. 2 plus 2, we say, is 4, and with glittering eye challenge the world to get around this great truth. Bartenders get around it every day for 2 quarts of alcohol plus 2 quarts of water do not make 4 quarts of highball, but something else. A chemical change shrinks the volume of the mixture. 2 plus 2 is 4 is a statement which may be true in one context and untrue in another. Find the referent. To what? Where? When? Upward reports of a primitive tribe whose language unmasks this absolute even more effectively. The tribe has a word for one, a word for two, but no word for four. The word for two is Burla. So when the chief intones the great truth, he says Burla and Burla is always and for forever Burla Burla. Mathematics, as Korzybski presents it, is a language with structural similarity to the human nervous system and to the world outside. If the cortex exercises its switchboards with mathematics, the man inside can improve his grasp of the world without. Witness the case of applying mathematics to Achilles and the tortoise. 
But if he neglects facts from the world without or makes false assumptions about them, he can strangle meaning as effectively with mathematicians as with other languages. The process is even more dangerous, for it is widely supposed that figures speak with extrahuman authority. In its field, mathematics is good human talk, just as music is. It developed, as we have seen, to meet urgent human needs. Combined with the operational approach of modern physics, it has extended knowledge into unprecedented areas. And the extension goes steadily forward. It has been taught us badly, and we shy away from its symbols. This is our misfortune, for mathematics might be a shield and buckler against ver verbal confusion. Music as Language both mathematics and music are international languages. Notes of music are signs which reach the ear through sound waves in the atmosphere. They are produced by vibrating a vocal cord or a string of metal or sheep gut, by blowing through a wooden tube, and by other mechanisms for producing vibrations. The vibrations are arranged in two ways. Number one, by varying relations of pitch or frequency of waves, either in sequence called melodic structure or simultaneously, as in a chord called harmonic structure. Number two, by varying the time of the release of sound waves, including the rate of melodic sequence, and so imposing repeated orderly divisions. These factors can be analyzed as mathematical relations, though it does not follow that music is a branch of mathematics. Nowhere are its structure and order more dramatically shown than when a great symphony or orchestra finishes tuning its instruments and at the top of the conductor's baton begins. For instance, the opening bars of Bo Beethoven's Seventh Symphony, what a change from chaos to order to the pleasure of perceiving structure and sound. When a group of people play or listen to the same composition, they are perceiving as a rule meanings similar to those of the composer. Minds meet. The variety of interpretation can change the meaning within narrow limits. The meanings are indescribable in words, but are readily perceived as order and relation. In addition, they seem to have a definite effect connected with the rhythm of pulse, breathing, and other human processes. Emotional effects are tied to the physiological. Perhaps musical structure comes close to the structure of the human nervous system. Modern composers are probably on a surer track when they invent new mathematical relations of harmony and rhythm than when they are concerned with bombarding all music prior to 1900. If they are trying to reflect human society in 1938, no discords could be strident enough. The task is obviously beyond them. Disorderly music is a contradiction in terms and in physical fact.